call the meeting to order. Um, we're uh, starting early. We've got a full agenda, uh, um, um, but one we're excited to work our way through. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, some interviews. Uh, we've got some applicants uh, for uh, the open uh, positions on the uh, DRB, um, as well as an application for uh, appointment to the social services. Um, and I think we'll probably just kind of roll, roll in that order. Um, do, was there also one for the Ordinance Advisory Committee? There's not, okay. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, so with that, um, uh, I think we'll start with uh, Phil Matson um, and uh, entertain some questions. Uh, you don't necessarily have to come to the front row. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't matter much. Um, uh, and uh, I guess we'll start with just kind of a, a personal statement. We, we got the email uh, that kind of got the description of, uh, of why you were interested, but if you can just kind of share that for, for the public, that'd be great. Sure. Um, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, I just wanted to help out. I saw that it was posting online for uh, members of the DRB. It seemed like something that I would be capable of doing, so I sent a letter to Barbara saying I'm interested. Uh, was there uh, anything particular about the uh, the DRB um, and its role that uh, interested you? Um, I mean, it didn't seem dull. <laughs> <laughs> like, it seemed like there could be some interesting things about it. It's not my area of expertise by any means, but um, when I saw it, I, there was definitely some other postings about um, Ordinance, ordinance mm -hmm. Review Board, and it just, to me, the DRB was the one I could most, like I fully understood, I thought, what the role was. So. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other are questions from the Select Board? Uh, just kind of work work our way down this way. So yeah, please. Can, yeah. I, can I just ask, Willa, did you get a chance to talk to the candidates? Um, Phil and I have spoken. I just spoke, um, yes. I'd like to hear yeah. your support of their candidates. Okay. Um, well, I, one of the things I said to Phil was that his story was similar to mine, that I was I saw a posting on Front Porch Forum, and I was interested in um, joining some effort in the community, and I thought that um, what Phil spoke about his interest and his ability to understand regulations, um, it sounded like you had both the skill set and interest commitment and um, he also recognized, uh, I think when we spoke, that there might be some challenges, like making difficult decisions. And Phil mentioned that. So from my conversation, it seems like Phil would be a good addition to our group. Thanks. Great. Um, well, I don't want to use up everybody's questions. Why not? I'll ask one anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, have you ever, have you ever had any experience, you understand what quasar judicial values? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just from the explanation so, provided by Villa and so, the, the Barbers, you know. So, um, as a member of the quasar judicial board, what you have to do is listen to the evidence, and then you have to make a decision um, as to whether or not they comply with the law based on the evidence without applying your own biases. And would you say you're able to do that? Sometimes it's hard, you know, to because yeah, you, you care so deeply. I think we sure. all care a lot about talents and have our ideas about how it should develop. Yes, I, I think so. I, I don't have any experience in that, right? So I think in my mind I can do anything. But <laughs> and some facts are maybe not so good at the, um, certain things. Um, I, I do believe I would be able to divorce myself from my own personal opinion. Be the, now I'm going to flip it around. There are also lots of times when the law isn't going to be you have a conditional use application and you have to decide whether or not the application is in the, what's the language of the law, whether or not it is in the character of the neighborhood. Yes. Um, obviously, one person's character of the neighborhood is another person's not so much in character. So. Our job is to try to choose people to be on the DRB who m reflect the desires of most of the people of Dallas. So let's suppose you had one 
where it was affordable housing and it was going to have an impact on the environment and you're going to sit somewhere on the spectrum mm -hmm. of that. Are you able to, to give us some indication of where you might sit on that spectrum? I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question, but that's Yeah, it's a hard one. I, I feel strongly about both. Um, yeah. I think I, at least at first I would look to the, the other leaders on the board to help me sort of learn how to approach such a problem. and. Um, if it were, I mean, if it were something where there was a clear regulation that conflicted in any way with either of those things, I think you kind of lean on that to come to a solution. It may not, either, it may, it may not be as uh, ideal, but you're capable, you're able to um, at least rest on the laws that exist. Yeah, when you're trying to figure out character of the neighborhood, the laws aren't going to be very clear <laughs> about what that is. So you actually are going to have to figure it out. And as you say, the people who've been doing it for a while will guide you, but you're going to have to figure it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. But where you sit on that, I'll give you another example. Undue adverse effect. Um, let's suppose you've got a gravel pit, and there's going to be a lot of noise. And it says there shall be no undue adverse noise. Well, again, one person's undue adverse noise is another person's very adverse noise. Mm -hmm. And you've got to figure out where you are. Like um, to me, I would have picked a scientific approach to that, would just get the decibel level at the locations and go from whatever, whatever the scientific you know, number was of decibel level being adverse, right? Mm -hmm. So that's got to lie in the spectrum somewhere as opposed to like curing health. That, that, that's how it yeah. Okay. Okay. You're an engineer. I am. Yes. So, what kind of engineer? I'm a software engineer. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping you were some kind of a builder type. <laughs> yeah. right. All the things I build are in little tiny boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zero <laughs> <and> ones. <laughs> All right. Let me give somebody else an error. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks. Um. So just um, Anne was saying how there's a range of uh, points of view on a board like this, and you bring your own uh, perspective and professional experience. Can you 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 mention engineering and management experience? Mm -hmm. um, can you can you just say a little more about what what you've done and what your experience is? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, well, let's see. Um, after I graduated college, I began working as actually sorry during college I began working as a software engineer for the National Institute of Transportation Technology. This was a, like a, you know, a non-profit organization for developing tech, uh, technology for like uh, signals and other things you put traffic lights and things like that. Um, that's where I first got my, that was my first professional job. I don't bore you with all the jobs no. in between. <laughs> like you. But um, for the better part of a decade, I was mostly just an individual contributor. Um, I, as I began to like gain more experience, I became a manager, and since that time, I've sort of bounced between um, what we call architecture, which is software architecture, um, engineering management, which is like director level management of engineering teams, and then right now I'm an individual contributor again with all those same titles, but there's only five people in the company, so I'm basically back to where I started <laughs> um, started and this startup. Um, I've managed teams from, you know, 15, 20 people is the largest. I do like, I've done the cross-functional team. So it's like, not everyone's a direct report to me, but I have people across multiple teams that are, you know, I'm coordinating like deployments for different pieces of software. So that's my professional experience is besides the building aspect where I'm just, you know, blah, 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 like that. Um, is really collaborating with other engineers, bringing, see, trying to get the best out of them. And, um, you know, I really believe that we're better as a team than we are as individuals. And so doing things like that. Okay, thank you. All for me. Um, I, I guess I don't have a specific question right now, but I did want to say that I've worked with uh, Phil for the last how long have you been on the store board? Eight almost, months, yeah. a year almost. Um, and I found him great on the store board. And like, you ask really good questions, you you get all the perspectives, you gather all the information, and then you know work towards the best decision moving forward. And I think 
the skills I've seen there will will translate and be a benefit on the DRB. I'm glad you're playing. Don't have any questions. Um, so uh, I'll kind of build off of what you're were last kind of expressing um, and, and knowing that through conversations that uh, that we've had with other DRB members, one of um, one of the challenges is that um, as the uh, as the regulations uh, get uh, get more complex uh, in their kind of interplay in different areas and, and the balances that they try to um, strike between development activity, responsible development activity, and um, preservation of natural resources, et cetera. Um, uh, on, on a more simplistic level, uh, there's been some feedback that um, that just the <laughs> the user interface, I guess, uh, for for folks uh, is is complicated, and and that setting the expectations uh, for applicants um, is an area that we could improve on as a town, uh, just in the either the resources that we make available or or setting expectations about what kind of what kind of things that we uh, need to need to see or would want to see. Um, and for me, that's very much a, a systems problem um, at, of all of the other problems. And I'm just kind of curious on whether or not you, you think you'd be able to help kind of apply yourself to um, the development of that, uh, those types of resources, or at least the organization of them. Um, it seems like you might have a, a unique uh, perspective on, on how how to take a look at how people are interacting with the DRB. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, we have some. So I guess what I would say is it's primarily the job of an engineering manager to do exactly that, right? It's, yeah. like to, it's not just your software, but it's your people and the interfaces between the two things. Figure out what makes sense there mm. and um, make everything more efficient. Right. Uh, that's primarily where I, I I find myself in my career right now doing the, those types of things still, even though I'm not working with a bunch of people, I'm working at smaller companies, but what I'm doing is I'm figuring out the most efficient way to apply external um, processes to software. I think that if we're talking about regulations for the DRB and the communication between um, the public and the DRB, I would use that same approach. I would just I um, look at, okay, where are the inputs here? And mm -hmm. where, um, how are we training people on what to expect? And, and trying to figure out better, better ways to do it. If there are any, maybe it just, maybe it just has to be a hassle. Yeah. Uh, the, the only other question I have is that um, uh, the meeting of the DRB is, is somewhat on an as-need basis. Uh, ex oh. I, I can address that for you. Okay. If you like. Maybe. <laughs> so the DRB has just this weekend set up a regular schedule for meetings. And so the next two meetings are on the first Monday of each month, November and December, 6 p.m. But starting in January, they're setting a set date of the third Wednesday of each month at 6 p.m. That is as needed. So it's easy to cancel a meeting mm -hmm. if you don't need it. But we have found that that without having it already on people's schedules and you reserving the date, it can be hard to pull everybody together. Sure. So if you could serve, re reserve Monday, Monday and Monday in November and December, the first Monday of the month, and the third Wednesday of every month through the year of 2025. And then you're free if there's no meeting. And so I'm going to ask that same question to Toby. Does that work for you as well, Toby? All right. Well, then that was it. <laughs> um, so I think it may make sense uh, to uh, consider appointments uh, in, in order, or would you like to do them later uh, after some discussion? Does anybody um, have an opinion? You want to vote right now? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I move to uh, yeah. appoint Phil to the DRB. Second. 
And that would be for oh. Barbara. By chance, did you have the two expiration the, dates? Yes. I'll, I'll put it right there in front of you. So no, thanks. You can guide that discussion. Thank you, as usual, Barbara. <laughs> um, well, since you went first, Phil, I guess, uh, do you have a preference on a term that expires in 2025 versus a term that expires in 2026? What does that mean to me? That That's a good question. I was just trying to think about that. But so, yeah. That's what it means. Yep. So with the 2025, generally um, how that uh, works with appointments, though so we, we've tried to, uh, or reappointments, we've tried to give a little bit more of an air gap between this schedule. But um, in the past, uh, reappointments were just kind of done shortly after town meeting day. Um, uh, and right now we're, we're trying to work towards being a little more kind of deliberate so that it's just not so automatic and it's, it can not take into some consideration uh, of any, any changes that uh, folks feel like need to be made um, and just provide some opportunity for feedback. So uh, reappointment for 2025 would probably happen sometime, I'd, I'd say two or three meetings after, after the reorganization of the select board following town meeting day. The, the design and um, development review board is a five year, no, a three year term. Okay. But you're being appointed to complete the term of a vacant seat. Sure. So that's why mm -hmm. we Got have it. a short term. But when you, get re, when you are reappointed, it would be a three year term. Yeah. Saying that, do you have any preference on which no. ones? Okay. Does anybody want to recommend one? Should we ask our other candidate yeah. if they have a preference? Uh, Rock, paper, scissors? Just, just the one. Yeah, the, so uh, the 26th. Oh, oh no, nope, nope, it's too late. I'm going right, to uh, put Phil up for the, uh, uh, put up a friendly amendment to Anne's motion uh, for the term ending in uh, 2026. Uh, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Congratulations, Phil. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Toby. I'm here. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a unique conversation because most of us have worked pretty closely with you in one capacity or another and uh, uh, are, are pretty comfortable with your qualifications, I think. Um, and so I, I guess, would you uh, be willing to make a personal statement as to what drew your attention to this? Um, yeah, so I'm just uh, hoping to help the town fill an, an empty slot. Um, I have a lot of experience and years of service to the town, including being on the planning commission and serving on the DRB and being the vice chair for a few years and alternates for quite some other years. So I literally have a lot of experience um, having dealt with this and you know, treated as a judicial board the facts are important, the regulations are important, um, community values are important. I, I worked on the town plan a couple of times on the planning commission, so I worked with townspeople about what the, what the scope and what the vision of the town is, so I have some perspective on that as well. Um, Can we just build that? Oh. Yeah, as far as other management, you know, I've worked for the highway crew and done the FEMA Reimbursement. I've done grant writing, a little bit of everything in town for so almost I've thirty. I've been on the select board for six years, seven years, and the fire department. When was the last? Uh, uh, when was the last time that you worked on the DRB? What was the? It was in the eight, late eighties, no, or mid nineties, I guess it was. Okay. Um, and so there have been some yep. changes to the zoning regulations since then, of course. <laughs> Yeah, there, there certainly have, and I'd, I'd say that, it, uh, and, and we're going through a pretty significant um, change in the town plan, and I think um, uh, to uh, Anne's point, there, uh, there are the community values, uh, the broader community values, I, I, I think, have, have always stayed the same, but the needs within the community uh, often change with time, um, and uh, I, I'm curious to what you see or have observed uh, as kind of the 
the needs of the well, community so, so in the present day. So the PRB is a judicial board, so it's really the fact, and, and the only time you have sort of community values is characteristics of neighborhoods and, and, and those kind of decisions. Mm. Most of the other decisions are based on you know, factual evidence and the regulations as they exist and actually read. And so essentially, um, uh, neighborhood characteristics are probably explained by the, by the participants who come in and, and, and other observers that are interested in that project is mm -hmm. going to end up in their neighborhood. Um, Does anybody else uh, want to offer up uh, any questions? Uh, well, the same question that Ann asked before, have, have Willa and Toby okay. have had a yeah. chance to chat? We, we have not. No, we have not. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Will it, is there anything you want to add to this? Or, or questions? Um, yeah. It sounds like Chloe has great historical expertise mm -hmm. and broad expertise in the community and clearly committed. So I, it sounds like another great addition to the board to just let board choose to approve this application. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, Bill? Do you have a question? No. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'd entertain a motion uh, to appoint Toby uh, to uh, the DRB for the term uh, ending in 2025. So moved. Second. Uh, all right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? Thank you very much, Toby and Phil. Uh, we appreciate the service. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, I guess, I guess, just to put on your radar, there's kind of an ongoing um, effort uh, led by Willa and the other uh, DRB members to kind of look for training opportunities uh, because we have gone through a recent regs change and, uh, and some of those have evolved and there's some uh, relative turnover uh, on, on the DRB. So, um, so I guess just kind of keep an ear out for those opportunities or if you come across one that is of particular interest, by all means, please uh, you know raise it to Will or the select board. Um, you know we're taking the training and onboarding of new DRB members uh, pretty pretty seriously. Yeah, and or Will. Um, maybe I just take a minute to say that our November and December meetings will um, be focused more on administrative matters, and we have discussed doing the training in January. Hopefully oh, great. The Vermont League of Cities and Towns one, but I wanted to check. Um, it is one that costs. I think it's two hundred fifty dollars. We included it in our proposed budget, but that's not for next year. So I wanted to ask whether there's any possibility of the town supporting that uh, expenditure this year. It's two hundred fifty dollars for the training, not for yes. the person. No, for the training. It's I think it's a two-hour training, and they um, from somebody from the week. Oh, okay. Um. I, I mean, I, I would certainly support that. We generally have a training budget. I don't know where we stand uh, with with our uh, training budget, but uh, that certainly sounds like something that we'd be pretty easy to accommodate, um, for sure. I should check in with Kari, or should, can I go ahead and approach the uh, to see about scheduling? Uh, yeah, I, I would. Uh, I think that that would be fine, um, and uh, coordinate coordinate that with Kari and and, and Barbara. There's a message from Tegan. Oh. Uh, we can try to do it in our town to split the cost. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's yes. something we can explore. Right. Oh, oh interesting. I'm trying to contact neighboring I mean, I'm happy to do that, or Tegan and Kari may have yeah, contacts. We, we can work on that. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to the uh, Advisory Committee uh, for Social Service Appropriations. Um, and we have an applicant, uh, and that is Chris. I'll move up. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I? Taking the move up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so for context, this is a, a, a review of uh, social services uh, appropriations that um, that come up. It was a a committee uh, that uh, has some some history in the in the community, um, and uh, we 
recently uh, decided to kind of reactivate it um, and seek some participation from the community. Um, what uh, what draw you, drew you to this particular opportunity? Uh, so my, my background is human services, social services, uh, most recently, uh, last 13 years until I retired a couple of years ago, worked for Washington County Mental Health. So I had a lot of contact with uh, Council on Aging, folks with illness, uh, other support services in uh, communities. Um, so it's kind of my view of the world, um, and I have some time. And this is, Great. my understanding is typically it's a one and done kind of deal. Um, so it's not a long commitment, so easy to step up. And I like being able to step up for the community. More of that. Great. Um, uh, there's kind of a, uh, a, a long list of these. Uh, do you serve in other any other capacities uh, that would put you in a in a weird position to have like a conflict of interest? I guess. Uh, you know, you... The, I thought about that. The closest thing I have is the fact that I worked for Washington Health right. for 13 years, um, and I know that they asked for fourteen hundred dollars that they have for the last several years. Um, that would be. Is, the closest I have, I'm okay. not currently serving on any other other boards, uh, not involved in any other agencies at this point. Um, I was the president of Central Vermont Runners for a couple of years. Um, yeah. So, but I don't think they asked me for any money. So. Okay. Yeah, that that's, that was the only one that kind of stood out to me. But yeah, thank you. Um, were there any other questions for Chris? I thought your letter. Said it yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> <a> good letter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think that's uh, pretty uh, straightforward, and, and obviously, to have, uh, I think it's great uh, to have your representation from the community, and yeah. uh, and thanks for stepping up for it. Um, so. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? One yeah. clarification, is yeah. there a term associated yeah, with that, that is or is it question. a lifetime appointment? <laughs> <laughs> it is a lifetime appointment. <laughs> uh, one and done, so. <laughs> but you will be asked next year, you can uh, assure yourself. Well, yes, I just like to. seconded that motion. I do. Thank you. Uh, any opposed, then I don't think there were any. And that is that is that. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the time, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, moving on uh, to the administrative uh, items on the agenda uh, and a call for additions and changes to the agenda. I don't believe there are, uh, though I don't know that we have. Hold on a second. Hold on. No. Okay. Great. Um, uh, approval of minutes from October fourteenth. So those were posted in the uh, in the share folder. Has everybody had the opportunity to review those? And does anybody have any uh, changes or adjustments? I'm trying to understand my own notes. Hmm. Um, in appointing the ordinance committee, I said it should say the committee will meet as needed. I think it says something about somebody will tell them when to meet. Didn't we tell them that they would figure it out for themselves? Um, I have to find it. I, I don't think that's like this. I don't know that that need, needs to be defined. I, I know that they're, the priorities of, of ordinance to work on would be. Um, Tegan says, yes, we were planning our own schedule. Yeah. So they'd be planning their own schedule. We, it would just yeah, be the select board think, setting the agenda. I have to find the copy of the minutes. I think that's not what it said. Oh, OK. No, I'm in the wrong I folder. I'm it. sorry. I, I'll have to find it and send it to you. That's fine. Uh, so I, I'm happy to just table table the minutes until next time. I think that that'd be fine. There's nothing. Oh, I think we can get to the bottom of this. Just move on to the next Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so a vote to approve the board order is also posted to the share, uh, share drive. Uh, has everybody had an opportunity to uh, review those and have any questions? And seeing no questions, can I get a uh, motion to approve? So moved. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, and uh, the signing of the Ordinance uh, Advisory Committee and Social Services uh, Appropriations Advisory Committee. So last time uh, we uh, reviewed the resolutions and made some changes. So uh, we just need to sign them uh, this evening because um, we only had the digital copies with us last time. So, yep. So I uh, just need a motion to sign what was uh, discussed and approved uh, at the last meeting. And that is, and, that and is the copy right. that's in our folder now. That's correct. Yeah. You okay. have this? This is the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So All motion right. to approve? Or sign, rather? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, the usual 15 minutes for uh, public comment on anything that is not on the agenda. So is anybody uh, attending or on Zoom that uh, would like to speak to anything that's not on the agenda? Nope. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Steve Gray. I'm here tonight representing the uh, local snowmobile club. Um, I'll try to keep it short because you folks have got a busy schedule. But we have a question regarding the Woodbury Mountain Road and the damage that was done to it in the last floods. Um, we maintain approximately 45 miles of trails in the town of Dallas and Woodbury, and we've been diligently working on them for the last two years to try to keep them up. Mm -hmm. That <clears throat> uh, Class 4 road suffered some severe damage uh, just south of the Woodbury Town line. And to the point that our grooming equipment can no longer get across it, and in fact, no vehicles can get across it, but four wheel drive vehicles going up are actually going around it and through the brook and et cetera. And that's totally unacceptable to us. Uh, so we would <clears throat> like to know if the town has any um, anticipation of doing anything, um, bare minimum, to uh, fix that area of the road. Um, so that the uh, public and us can use it um, to some degree. Or if not, um, what is the town's opinion on us trying to do something to it? Uh, I will say our funds are very limited because of the amount of damage we have had to repair over the last two uh, summers. And uh, the Vermont Association of Snow Travelers is also suffering uh, considerably from statewide damage that is depleted their treasury. So uh, I, I won't take the time. I just wondered if there's any comments on that or if you're thinking about or could participate or do something to, to remedy that problem. Uh, well, uh, we uh, maintenance of Class Four roads uh, is uh, is is an area of discussion uh, for sure, um, uh, and um, Woodbury Mountain Road has come up recently. Um, there are there are some other issues that have been raised that uh, may require some attention from the town. Um, that I think we'd be in the position to uh, either <laughs> approve being performed or uh, to self perform. So I, I guess I wouldn't commit to anything specifically. Uh, tonight, but I, I would say it looks like Kari's got um, something to mention too. But I, I think you know we could, at the very least, commit to uh, having a road crew kind of taking a look at that particular stretch and kind of weigh weigh what we may be able to do uh, efficiently to and and how it might you know service the uh, service the rest of the community um, by doing that. We have had a couple of different contractors look at it in anticipation. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like just your information that a day yeah. or a minimum of an excavator up there, we think there's enough material alongside the washed out material, other material that can be uh, worked into the roadbed mm. for the purpose of what we need it and I think what others need it for because they're, they're not obviously going to build a new highway up there. Right, right. But uh, to make it safe and usable. Um, just, that's just for your information. So if the town was considering, I think they're excavator in one day, and you might be able to help with any brush cutting or something like that. Okay. But um, time is of an essence because we are closing in on winter. And yeah. If we're not going to be able to do anything. Um, we're going to try to try to do something. I don't I, know I'd put this one. So, to, yeah, so why don't I? Um, 
commit to sending a you know, foreman up there and yep. take a look and see what the scope is and, and try to match that with the remaining scope of work that we've got here. for other stuff, yeah. Um, and um, see if we can't do something. We did do a fair amount of work on Woodbury Mountain after the July flood, but only up to where yes. it's yeah. very, very good job. <laughs> um, so, and, and there are quite a few things on the list before winter hits, but um, we can at least take a look and, and see if it, if it works. And yeah. if, if, if it does, we'll go ahead. If it doesn't, I'll report back. And maybe I'll report back to, to, to Bill or something. So Keep it yeah, I'd be happy to assist as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. That that sounds good. I think that that would be great. That's fine. I, the only reason I'm here is just find out. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and if not, we're going to have to figure out something. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing it to our attention and um, and stand by. We'll uh, have somebody go up and take a look and see um, if we can if we can work it into the scope of work uh, before winter. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, yep. Kari sent me the minutes and I found the sentence I was talking about. Okay. I want to go back to that for a second. That sounds great. So it says the select board will tell the committee when it needs to meet. That's what I was objecting to. Right. I wondered if it should instead say the committee will meet as needed or something. Right. I think the intent of that was the select board will sort of tell the committee when there's work that needs to be done. But I, I see your that. point. I think when I read it, I thought, no, wait, yeah. that, that doesn't sound right. So I just wondered whether we could just change that to say the committee will meet as needed. I, I'm comfortable with that yeah. change. All right. Um, we'll get that noted. With that change, is everybody else comfortable with the, uh, the minutes as, uh, as circulated? Yes. You got a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to uh, move to the review of the modification of the previously approved uh, permit to run underground power. Uh, so this is a uh, work in the right of way uh, modification, application modification uh, or revision, I guess, um, uh, relative to getting power to the Seaman parcel at uh, 1419 Worcester Road. Uh, and uh, Andy's present, so uh, welcome Thank you. back. Yeah, really appreciate <laughs> and it. sorry to hear the, the struggle. Uh, that sounds like a, a real headache. Um, yeah, it's been a long road, but we, I appreciate you putting us on. I know it's yeah. last minute. Yeah. Uh, and do we have anybody from what? Brian. Brian Wilkins here, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so has everybody had a chance to review the documentation re relative to this? So uh, just for everybody else's uh, public's edification, uh, essentially this is a, a permit to work in the town right of way or for uh, WET to perform some work in the town right of way, uh, which includes uh, burying underground primary uh, down uh, the length of the Worcester Road, uh, which was previously uh, approved. Uh, and now also, um, needs to include a, uh, a segment of Collar Hill Road, which uh, was originally thinking would not be the, the need, um, but couldn't quite get there. Um, so I, I don't see any particular uh, issue with this other than I sympathize with the cost that that might uh, come um, uh, to you guys. Um, it looks like, so is it not going all the way down the Worcester Road? Uh, it's only going partially to the driveway? So the, yeah, so it, the, the route down the Worcester Road hasn't changed. There's like yeah. 600 feet or so down Collar Hill because we were no longer, we weren't able to secure an easement for yeah. overhead pole uh, on Malone's land. And so we're now, uh, there's 600 additional feet on Collar Hill. And the, it goes down to what is an old, uh, Forest Road access to our upper field, and then well, that that is as it was previously built. Yeah. Um. So I'm sorry. Just to be clear yep. about the modification, is the yellow highlighted on the application? That's correct. Additional yeah. undergrounding. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Brian, is there any change in? Uh, I guess the 
scope or technique, it's going to still be the same pieces of equipment. Um, and the, I think it's a vibratory plow, and that's going to travel along the outside portion of the road uh, or uh, under the travel portion of the road. I think the goal is to obviously get it off to one side for sure, get it out of the travel portion, um, stay within the technical road area. And if we can get off to the side a little bit, we'll utilize that if we can. Uh, I think it's open at this point, whether it's a normally uh, dug ditch or the vibe plow. I don't think that's totally been decided at this point, um, but that's what we're working off from at this point. Um, well, I had, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Or concerns these days are to have yeah. a, a as build reply. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say I, I appreciate the uh, the drawing. This one's been a little more detailed uh, than the, than the last couple, so I think that's that's awesome from the documentation um, uh, side of things. And I I would just continue the request that uh, once uh, once the infrastructure is in ground, if we could get a uh, as built uh, representation uh, that that documents where the stuff is so that we can have that on file for for the road crew uh at the at the town uh that would be greatly appreciated absolutely uh, and uh, so with that i would uh entertain a motion to uh approve the amended application can I just ask yep. one question sure okay, sorry so this is going to affect neighbors um have the neighbor are the neighbors on notice uh, is this an extension of the number of neighbors that are going to be affected or what do we know about neighbors uh, well, I would say that the previous line was going to come off the same pole okay. uh, on Collar Hill as it is now. Yeah. So there are no new individuals affected. Okay. Um, there's a change from overhead with that one individual where they're pulling power off the current delivery point. Okay. And uh, but it's just the method has changed. Okay. And okay. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Or conditions then? No. Um, so with that, I entertain a motion to um, to approve the amended application uh, effective uh, immediately this evening. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good luck, Andy. Yeah. 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 No problem. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, we'll move on to the next one. Um, and uh, we've got the Woodbury Fire Department uh, present. Um, and the new president. Hi. Congratulations. Feel free to come on up. Where's... No, no. Front and center is mandatory. That's the fire chief. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is Paul, our fire chief, Paul Cerruti. Um, by our bylaws, he handles all the operations, but by law, by law, I handle what he's not. Feel free to take a seat. You don't actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what he's not doing, um, and I think the important thing that I would like you to know about me and my being on the fire department is I am not a firefighter, nor am I am. So I came on board, you know, after this last flood, you've got the fire chief doing both jobs and, and handling a lot of contracts and everything. There were presidents and James, James did a lot of things, I'm not saying that. It's just that the overwhelming burden of that flood and all that paperwork, and I said, well, I can do paperwork. We <laughs> <laughs> enjoyed it. <laughs> I kind of do enjoy it. So anyway, that's that's what I'm doing. It's kind of a first for the fire department that the, the president has always been a firefighter, and mm. I think times are changing. And uh, you know, with the level of medical calls that we are getting, um, it's it's getting harder and harder to to manage all that by one person or two people. So so I have fire chief Paul, vice president Jacob Cerruti, and then an active member. Uh, Mariah Mitchell um, here with me tonight. So, uh, do you have any questions or? 
Because we uh, put a name to the faces. No. We, no, I was going to say, why don't we do a quick intro so that we can just have names and faces. Yeah. Well, I've been to a few of these. Yeah, I'm in Winchester. And I've seen you in action, and I know that you've been basically running the last few meetings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chris Mahali. I'm a select board member. Mr. Sarudi, had, both of the Mr. Sarudis have been to our house for a stupid fire alarm thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you. I appreciate you. Jamie Morby. Uh, Jordan Keyes. Bill Davis. I'm Corey Bradley, the town minister. Uh, and and I. Uh, I'd uh, say that it, it, I think it's great that the uh, fire department was taking a look at how how to get the work done and willing think to outside think outside the box. Uh, you know, I think you guys have demonstrated that a number of times over the last year, and mm -hmm. uh, really would like to commend uh, you guys for for that and and your effort. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. When I when I came on board, all I did was watch. Yeah. Um, when I came on July of last year. Um, and I watched, and I told James, I said, James, just know I'm learning from you, okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you know, I watched one truck check in January, and I said, okay, I'm not doing that again, sorry. <laughs> just not, sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been quite a learning experience to learn a lot about fire, and I now know new ways to die. So. <laughs> it seems to me you do more ambulance than fire. They do. Yeah, the medical calls are incre increasing for mm -hmm. both towns. We think we did 120 last year for both towns, and it's going up. 120? Wow. Mm. Yeah, we have um, 11 firefighters who are also EMTs. That's Paul and Jacob are both, do both. And I uh, have a total of 12. EMTs are? EMTs. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've got we've got a we large have several in the pipeline because it takes yeah. a long time to get. Yeah, and so it's. Um, I know two two from from Callis have, have contacted me and, and yeah, we've got room. Um, and most of us are also working with these small players, so if they have staffing issues, we can jump on the ambulance mm -hmm. with them. So that's. Is that what you do? Yeah. Because okay. yeah. yeah, if some if a person in Callis has a nine one one call. Yeah, if they're short. You guys are coordinating on jump on account. and taking crew mm -hmm. the ambulance and. We're doing joint trainings every quarter now with both departments, hmm. which has been a big positive since we work together a lot. So it's been a good effort to keep things covered. Uh, does the department take that approach with any other communities with East Montpelier, or is it we're, just Calais? Well, in the other direction, where most of us are members of Harbor Rescue as yeah. well, which okay. has saved lives then too. Yeah, yeah. If they're a second call, one of us can jump the ambulance and crew it. Hmm. So we're doing that in a couple directions. Yeah, yeah. It just gives mm. versatility because again, if you're a second call, sometimes it's tough to staff that second ambulance. Right. Yeah, the fact that they're all volunteers, you know, it's not they're not always in town. So the more you have of them, right. the more right. chances just increases are the happening. agile coverage. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, and thanks for coming in person and, and doing introductions. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. I'm curious how yeah. going with the FEMA reimbursement. And so <laughs> <laughs> do well with FEMA. FEMA, we got $3,900 for our emergency response. And after, I'm going to keep it as clean and clean. <laughs> yeah. They ran me through the gauntlet for the last year and several months and then wow. basically sent a guy to kick us out the door with nothing. <gasps> wow. So wow. we got nothing. Uh, wow. I sat on some of those phone calls. That was just. Because they just told you, well, we're sorry they told you that. They were wrong. So I did 25 meetings and filled out 100 forms. Yeah. So you're starting from scratch for your new station. So what's happened, we, we, the, the town funded the, the main part of the station that's currently under construction. I received an earmark through Senator Sanders a year ago, which we couldn't apply to the new building because it was already funded. Because yeah. they, don't, they don't, I forgot the term they used with it. You can't supplant. Yeah. yeah. But we had reduced the size of the building, so we're, we're going through the process with rural develop, uh, community, USDA rural, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. community facilities rural development, right. I got it backwards, right. to, to put that 2,000 square foot back on. Oh. So right. we kind of, I've gone through the environmental assessment, we're dealing with some, I have an adjacent property that had a fuel spill, which the state petroleum, pro we have no pollution, but there's some planning and testing, so that's kind of working through. So. 
the original goal was to work on that next summer, but whether it's going to, you know what I'm saying, that, mm -hmm. that, that looks like it's actually going to happen, okay. which would get us completely out of the floodplain because all right. of our stuff is still flooding. We flooded again this year. Mm -hmm. So we've had to morph from our original plan of trying to keep that building that's getting flooded and we're mm -hmm. trying to get all that square footage over across mm -hmm. the street. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of uh, making everybody happy at this point, yeah. doing all the prep planning, So, which I can't. Push, you know, you, I got an architect, I got all, you just kind of let the, the wheels roll. That makes some sense. And you can help with federal anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Kind, of, no, kind of moves at his own. Our original goals was to have it approved by now. We haven't even got it submitted. But <laughs> it's still grinding away. And you've got the assistance of these agencies, right? I mean, you're working with the, the, the U.S. USDA or US USDA, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. because yeah. it's an earmark too. That I've yeah. had been in conversations with the senator, the senator's office. Okay. So he's on top of it, and the, and the local person from Burlington is on top of it. So so we're we're not in the in the in having to uh, win in essence. We just have to meet all their requirements. Right. Which again, the fuel thing kind of delayed us because again, there's no fuel on our property, but the environmentalist says, right. well, we better plan for right. it and do some studies. Mm -hmm. So that's. And then that was going to be expensive, but we got the petroleum cleanup fund is going to pay for that. So, but I just got to kind of wait for this all to kind of play out because USDA is saying they won't let us move forward until that's resolved. So, we're hoping well, to be in the new facility by doors. January, I hope. Wow. Yeah. So, do you want the station has doors? And yeah, doors. If you ever want to visit, give me a call. You got my contact information. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Okay. Appreciate yeah. it. Doing a long agenda. Uh, yeah. Question from the community? Oh, we really, really appreciate you guys. You're the closest to me and sure. really helped out a mm -hmm. number of times. Yeah. Um, is the select board uh, fully briefed about what the town's uh, um, potential involvement in the, in the station might be if none of these things come through? Uh, I don't believe we have entertained a, a specific proposal. <laughs> All the other funding sources seemed pretty, uh, pretty solid. So it seems like this is a fairly relative development. Um, so, so the, what's gone on is there were members of the former boards involved in the planning process. Right. Uh, the only uh, funding that's Woodbury's fully funding the part that's being built now. If we were to say, hey, we're going to come, you guys, and ask for some of that as part of a contract, that would be a whole new conversation to have. Uh, those discussions were talked about anecdotally in those meetings, but hasn't been done. So there'd be no surprises. That'd be a, more of a long-term conversation if that were to come up. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's certainly keep this pop up on a <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. We come in and say, yeah. hey, okay. here's our thoughts. What do you guys think? And we kind of come in that way. That, that's a good okay. Well, thank Not you. Not on the radar at the moment. Okay. I got too many mm -hmm. irons in the fire. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well, feelings mutual. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, again, thank you. And uh, t Doug, did you have a question well, for Woodbury? Over mm -hmm. here, a fire on my leg here is a really ill fire. I called to Okay. Go to okay. Okay. Where you go? Gotcha. Okay. Don't you come here? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, on <laughs> on that note. I don't want to be a party to any insurance investigation. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, and uh, we're, we're going to move yeah. on. Yeah. Great. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, moving on uh, to the traffic ordinance. Um, Want me to intro this one? That sounds great, Carrie. So based on the conversation we had two weeks ago, we have a draft for you to consider. There's, I would say, three categories of changes. One is lowering the primary speed limit on Lightning Ridge to 30 miles per hour. The other is the addition of uh, a yield sign in uh, Advan Village based on the recommendation of um, Ruben McMartin, who's with us tonight from Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and then 
Um, the addition of road names and some changes to labels, you know, mainly the state, state highway versus town highway, which I take it as something that's changed more recently. Mm -hmm. um, so all that's in there. A um, couple things that are not in there are, um, right at the end of the meeting, I recall there was a discussion of should, should we include a stop sign at the end of Kent Hill Road right over here at the junction with, with Keith and Brook and North Cowles. That's not in there. Um, that When we found the version that was proposed in 2022, that, that was included. And then um, likewise, the, the 2022 select board proposed stop signs in Adamant Village at two, junk, two roads, Center and Haggett. Um, so I just want to point those out because um, they were on the table before and as part of uh, boy, which one's going to be easier? Uh, does anybody have any questions? Maybe we'll start with the Adam and Village ones and we'll sure. uh, and, uh, get the feedback from Ruben while he's joining us. Um, and then, and then we'll try to wrap up the conversation. Great. Uh, Ruben, do you have anything you want to um, say to intro that? Um, I think. So people have had a chance to to look at those those couple of preliminary concepts that I knocked together for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so I got um Carrie got a hold of me and and you know said that there had been um or there not had been there there were ongoing uh concerns regarding speeds uh, through Adamant Village and uh potential uh safety issues uh with with the um pedestrian traffic uh that that the village sees as well as um during special events so i came out and did a did a site visit and and you know got the got the explanations of um you know particularly during special events uh, some of the concerns and um, the constraints on <clears throat> sight lines and took that back and and did a think about it and uh, came up with these these couple of concepts mostly as a means of taking a first crack to to open up the conversation about uh, what's what's feasible, preferable, desirable at that location. So, uh, these aren't right. This isn't uh, set your sign at this location, this distance from the road, this height, uh, you know, level of uh, uh, design. Um, this is more the here are a, here are a couple of ways that uh, that I think this could this could be approached. Um, I know that you mentioned. Um, there's there was mention of what roads you would want to to control and in looking looking at uh the area um my my assessment was that uh the most constrained sight lines were coming off of Haggett, right you have uh the co-op building on the one side and then you have uh some trees um on what would be the the right hand side coming into the village that obstruct the the view through to center road so that uh, a control device you know a control signage there um you know be it be it yield or or stop um based on uh based on my my gut feeling and impression and a lack of uh verifiable count data you know professional judgment i guess you'd call it i my feeling was that a yield sign would probably be sufficient to get people down to a speed where they would have the uh reaction time available to decide whether to stop or proceed once they got down to a point where they could actually see what the other approaches were. Um, the other piece was um, 
trying to trying to manage the Sodom Pond Road adamant merge uh, and particularly conflicts there, where adamant is the the um, higher tier facility, I guess you, we could call it, um, and that there is there is a site constraint there, and so that it would be worth um, considering, you know, potentially pending further investigation, uh, the installation of a yield on, on Sodom Pond Road to make sure that people are, again, really coming down to, really coming down to speed so that there's um, a minimization of, of potential conflict and, um, you know, uh, at, at that, at that why. So Ruben, can I um, ask for some clarification here, uh, some professional clarification? Um, sure. Uh, it's been a long time since driver's ed, uh, but um, some of the uh, conversation uh, that uh, transpired during our last meeting was around uh, yield versus stop. And these are kind of unique situations because we're talking about un unsigned rural roads with fairly uh, <laughs> by development standards, uh, low traffic uh, rates, I guess. But um, what what is kind of, well, what's the difference? My understanding of a yield, I guess, would be that uh, that whoever has the yield sign. So in one of these uh, scenarios, you've got somebody coming into uh into the village uh, uh by way of Haggett uh road and coming to a yield sign is that an indication that they need to yield to traffic coming from the other uh from the other roads at that intersection yes um here it would be the thinking is that it would <sighs> approaching a yield um knowing that if there is other traffic, you will need to yield to it, mm -hmm. right? So that it's not a mandatory stop. Mm -hmm. That that the the response should be the expected response is that drivers approaching a yield will approach that yield sign at a speed where they are capable of stopping if they need to, which is I think not necessarily the case with drivers through the village at this point. Um, so that was that was the thinking on yield should be sufficient for the purpose. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. How do you feel about Quarry Road? Um, I was not sure about Quarry Road. It's a dead end. Um, I wasn't really able i when i was out there i didn't i didn't see anybody using it um and so my thinking is that generally volumes should be sufficiently low that i wasn't terribly concerned with it if it is a point of concern it can be considered I guess my only concern would be at, at, at those acute periods of time when there is a an event and you have traffic coming out of that road, and we'll, let's just make a gross assumption that many of them are from outside of the community and not familiar with the dynamics of the village uh, or disoriented, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I don't want to belabor this conversation. You know, I think it's a, a probably one that warrants uh, more more study but you know i think uh, i've got lingering concerns about like if it doesn't have the desired impact and we have kind of issues of enforcement if we try to target it as a as a as an, uh, an enforcement area let's just make sure we have a plan for an extra yield sign somewhere else in the community where it might make more sense as a as a yield sign proper as opposed to a pay attention to this upcoming intersection um, and, you know, behave accordingly uh, type sign. Um, so, uh, you know, personally, uh, my my leanings are for concept one, uh, which, you know, has 
uh, uh, few, fewer signs, but I think hit pedestrian warnings on the major traffic routes, uh, and then a pair of yield, uh, yield signs, one on uh, Haggett Road uh, and one on uh, Sodom uh, Bond Road, which you know I think that one makes plenty of sense relative to what I imagine is the more predominant traffic patterns uh, relative to those two roads. Does that uh, sound fairly reasonable? Um, one and two are reversed in this. It is, yeah, it is. It is. So one comes second. Well, thank you. The only thing I would say about that is 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 the slow you know, it, um, concept one. You have the slow and the yield sign kind of together there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see the slow sign moved further up the road as it is in concept two, only because people do walk back and forth by the uh, by the water there. Mm -hmm. um, they need a chance to slow down before they get to the yield sign, in my opinion. Yeah. And don't forget, there is a plan to install speed detection radar signs, mm -hmm. both on Adaman Road and on Haggett, and those would be further up. Okay. All right. It might serve that purpose you're just Okay. Any other commentary or questions? I think so. Okay, well, are you saying one and two and two is one? Uh, yeah, in red, there's, there's a label on the graphic. Oh, on the graphic. Oh, okay. and, um, you don't see that? Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. 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 Well, mine is cut up. Oh. 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 Yeah, slide two is comes up. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm curious about any conversations that have taken place with Adamant residents, yeah. if there have been any. Question. <laughs> there, there, there only one is uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is a, I don't actually know if there's a question that is locked in. Um, it is a funny little traffic area in front of the store, um, but I don't know exactly why this, I have no um, idea of why this came up or anything. I'm here for the town plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so minimal. The only person that I've spoken with was, is Chris Anderson, who was just here, and he, he was there with Ruben and I yeah. that day talking it through. Um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to, to you know, instruct me to go back out and talk to see more folks about it. what do you think. I mean, it was also on the agenda. Uh, yeah, it was. And is that my dots? Talking? Dots on. I don't know if she wants to weigh in, but. That was just my one. You know, That's a good question. <laughs> kind of curious what the co-op people think. Right, because I know I know it's come up several times from Adamant residents, and I'd hate to make a decision and then have people oh, be like, like, wait, that's oh, not. It looks like that uh, is awful. I feel like that has heard a lot from being at the store, too. Right. And here she is. <laughs> hey, Dad, do you want to provide some commentary on behalf of that? Can you hear us? We can hear you, Dot. What's going on? Can, can you hear us? Yeah. Yep. Hello. Yeah, you're good. Oh, they can hear you. We, we can't. can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> Turn off your speaker. Yeah. Turn your speaker on. Sorry, is there a way? Oh, my. Oh, uh, Chris and I are both here, and we do have thoughts yeah. on the traffic issues down there. And it's a danger zone, for sure. But we cannot hear you. Hmm. Well, that's strange. Uh, can, can other people on Zoom hear us? Yeah. We've been. Oh, I guess we are Ruben, I imagine yeah. you can still hear us. Is that true? Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. I'm wondering, I was going to say settings, uh, maybe. Click on the click on the air. Uh, air. I'll, I'll put something in the chat for them. <laughs> um, and then Kari has shared the concept plans. So this is concept one. It calls for two yield signs, one on Haggett entering into the village, and then one on Sodom Pond Road entering onto uh, Adamant Road. And then there are three. Um, what do those say? Slow pedestrian traffic. traffic. And this is in addition to an already approved plan to install a speed detection sign on Haggett Road coming down and on Adamant Road coming down. Coming into the village. 
I mean, into the village, yeah. Can, can people in Zoom see this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it should, should be open. Okay. That's, that's concept one and... This is kind of fucking in the joke a little bit, but I feel like ever since right after I moved here, one of the speed signs opened up on Lightning Ridge and now these three in Adamant, and I'm wondering if maybe am I the problem? I don't know. <laughs> I'll definitely slow down. <laughs> <laughs> See, it worked out right. Here, here's... Well, there is a voting by by <laughs> by right pedal, this debate that has been had. But, um, you know, I think if I... Am afforded a little bit of uh, leeway here. You know, I think that the what was kind of problematic about the previous uh, previously warned and proposed uh, ordinance is that there weren't uh, traffic studies that were associated with them, and there is very specific uh, due diligence that is recommended by uh, the Central Vermont Regional Planning uh, around how to adopt certain changes and regulations and enforcement on on roads. For um, and so we we weren't at uh, it, it, it when we revisited the dialogue, uh, largely it's been a speed conversation. And then when you get to speed conversations it, uh, in the Adam and Village um, uh, area, it, it quickly uh, transitions to uh, this uh, very quote unquote problematic um, and <laughs> unique intersection of uh, of roads and how do we get there and. Uh, in previous conversations, we um, were like, well, put stop signs on everything because that's the easiest thing to do and everybody stops. Uh, um, but um, we uh, decided to reach out to uh, to Ruben to see if we could get any uh, clarification. Um, you know, I think we, I think this is a, a, a good first effort to try to put something in place that is based on, you know, sound professional uh uh input um and experience and if we need to revisit it um in the not too distant future we've got a, a way to do that and that would probably require um a, a a more deliberate i guess or specific uh study uh of what what direction traffic is coming from et cetera et cetera this doesn't include any speed um or traffic volume study right that couldn't be done until the spring. Right. I'm wondering if Dot and Chris can, can uh, speak now. Does that work? Yeah. What do you want to know? <laughs> can you hear you? Okay. We're just looking for uh, some uh, some input uh, uh, on on the conversation, I guess, uh, from, from Adamant uh, residents. Well, it's been there's been an increasing issue with speeders and they don't stop. And we've had, you know, especially when we have folks there for exhibits or the music school is in session, uh, people are always out walking dogs um, and it's five roads in, you know, and there's not a single stop sign. Um, so it's really rough and they're coming downhill and they have blocked, blocked um, site lines. And um, I don't know, I've seen a lot of close calls and they're, folks who they not only do they race down the road and cut the corner but you know they're in the middle of the road so there's some confrontations that happen with other vehicles because mm -hmm. there's no room to pass so so you know there's a lot of anecdotal information um right. as everyone's aware summer times every friday mm -hmm. there are lots of kids and adults cookouts Due to the Adamant Co-op cookouts, uh, I happened to be there with Carrie um, and talking, um, and we saw delivery trucks who are showing up every day. They add to the blockage in regards to sight lines. Um, so again, there's a lot of anecdotal information. Um, there seems to be an increase in traffic. Again, that's all anecdotal. So I'm really looking forward to actually getting some counts. Uh, I would also be very interested in once the uh, radar um, speed is set up to get a sense of what people are doing when they're coming down Haggett, which from my perspective is the, the main road into the mm -hmm. village. 
uh, versus center or uh, coming down Adamant Hill or off of Sodom. Uh, because it is 25, there's a speed limit uh, sign that says 25 just coming into village uh, off of center, as well as it just um, coming down at the town line on Haggett. There's a 25 mile an hour speed limit sign there. Um, and whether it's, it's cyclists or cars, uh, people, you know, they get a little downhill, the road straightens out, um, the sight line's pretty good and they zip along and then they come to that corner by the church. Um, and again, this is all anecdotal, so I'm looking forward to those counts um, to get more accurate information to base uh, decisions on. But those of us who are here, we have a lot of kids, a lot of dogs, a lot of events, um, and and no signage, basically. You know, there's that one sign by Allison's house, but nobody can see it. That was that's the speed limit, 25 speed limit on center road coming into the village, which we had to go look for. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'll I'll be a little more specific. Is there any strong objection? uh to the, the the signage proposal that we're considering now um other than you know i think that there is it, it, there is a lingering question on the table about uh whether you know stop signs are uh, are needed and, and where where to place them i i'm personally feeling like we don't maybe have all of the data needed to kind of make that decision but um, does it seem reasonable to uh, to adopt a, a combination of yield pedestrian uh, signage now uh, with the uh, commitment to uh, having the radar signs uh, placed so that we can start uh, start getting a better idea of what the traffic volumes are from various directions and speeds and and take further action um, as as we get more data? Does that seem? Mm -hmm. It makes complete sense to me. I mean, safety is the issue. We have a yeah. lot of folks in town who don't want to, um, you know, impact on the historic nature of our village, mm -hmm. uh, which signage does, but it's already there. So limiting it and giving us, you know, a first shot at changing behaviors, it makes total sense. Yeah. And, uh, and Ruben, oh, okay. I was just going to say sign, signs, you know, it's easy to put a sign up and to take it down if it, you know, if it's seen as not working. Um, we, we have, for these signs, I think we have plenty of other areas in the community. The recycling signs is likely not a problem uh, for for the town of Cowles. Uh, Ruben, I have one more question um, at, while the radar conversation has uh, come up. Um, so if, if we place um, the radar signs and we know that they uh capture data does that data uh count towards uh 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 central vermont's uh or uh, regional planning traffic studies like can that can that be data be used in tandem uh with with your counting methodologies or equipment um so that data can be uh, if it's not if it's not in the exact format that we use, mm -hmm. um, pretty much as long as there's um, so we normally use tube counters, and one of the things that we can get out of those is, are what are called class counts um, mm -hmm. because of the because of their ability to measure vehicle speed. Um, they can also uh, because right you have you have two tubes. With, at a fixed distance from each other, you know that distance, the time interval between, you can determine speeds, then you can determine number of axles, so you can figure out what what size vehicles, right? Um, like, is it a tri-axle dump truck? Is it a, is it a you know, yeah. passenger car, whatever? Gotcha. Um, that would be the, that would be the only real piece um, that I can imagine missing from the data out of those speed signs, and that's, that wouldn't really be an issue. The only thing I can imagine is, we might have to do a little bit of formatting work on our end, but as long as there's, as long as there's a timestamp, um, you know, a timestamp associated with the speed measurement, then that can get converted into uh, into a, a traffic count um, and a speed count. So, you know, it's a little it's a little bit of work in Excel maybe to do that conversion. 
Uh, I have a quick question yep. um, because the only thing I can really see is people not liking the signs is just for aesthetic reasons. And I'm wondering like if there was real pushback, if like we were to make our own signs that say slow down, you know, painting, making them all cute. Um, is there like some, are they not enforceable by law or like what are the downsides um, to trying to, you know, maintain our you know, aesthetic? Um, I think we also have a lot of artists. I can totally see that being a thing. Because okay. if you aren't slowing down already to look at the ponds, then I'm so I'm just trying to think about how to really make this work. Right. I mean, Maple Corner used to have a whole slew of hand painted yeah. signs that had sort of funny rhyming slogans mm -hmm. and um, I other than potentially I think ours just were out in the summer and not winter. Yeah. I think other other than the issue of town right of way and plowing, the, you know, they're not enforceable by right. law. But I think there's nothing wrong with sort of cutesy slow down in the village. I'm just trying to think of ways that can my kids happy. play here. I think that's not that's not uncommon to see around town. I would be concerned about you know taking that approach with the with the yield uh, yes, time. Uh, and, and you know maybe there's room on the uh, on the table to talk about it uh, for like the pedestrian traffic one for sure. Uh, you know I also you know, to my earlier point I think you know we we probably have more uses for these and so if we can in the interim get something installed um, and start gleaning you know any kind of information about their their impact and um, and if. You know, if folks in the community are, are motivated to look into um, uh, the the homemade or locally sourced signage, uh, I think that's that's a that's a fair that's a fair thing to take a look at. Um, so I, I think it's a yes and type conversation for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so with that, uh, do you think we can kind of pull a left so around I, and up? I, I think not. Yep, sorry, right. Ruben. So just, and I'd be interested what Vicki thinks of this. Um, you know, I hate to talk about more signs, but people get lost. And our village, um, Adamant Road's marked, Center Road's marked, Quarry is marked, but Haggett is not in the village. Right. It isn't. No. That's a good point. And people come in and say, where the heck am I? You know, what road? <laughs> so I don't know. Road signs in in here? Do we have road name signs? No, I'm just saying is that that's not. I don't think that that's dictated by the traffic ordinance, right? The just the placement of road name signs. Yeah, I don't think they're in there. I bet it's because the other one gets stolen all the time. Yeah. So I. Um, I doubt. I guess I'd like to maybe table that one, um, just because I think that we could likely just uh, just have a separate conversation or adopt a yeah. put a, put a, a road name sign up there. Yeah. All roads. It's right. just a matter of getting it on the list for the next time we order. And getting it not and making sure it doesn't get stolen. Well, yeah. I mean, we do. But they have all that granite out there. Just put it on really big blocks. <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> um, so are we uh, kind of co coalescing around uh, option? One or two uh, for those at all? Can we I'd like to move option one? Well, uh, I like that. The one with one fewer sign. The one with one fewer sign. That sounds good. Sure. All, all right. That. All, right. Uh, all in favor? All right. Wait, what, why are we? Well, I'm not sure. I'm just <laughs> trying to register everybody's support of that particular amendment to the traffic ordinance, and then we'll just adopt them all. That could be a straw poll. Yeah. That, all right. So that's a straw poll. That was a straw poll. If it may be temporary. But isn't it? It's just something we will try. We, we are. I'm sorry. That, that was not a motion. That was a straw poll. So it, we're all in favor of I'll option one. As between one and two, mm -hmm. we like option one. Option one. And so option one will be uh, represented as the signage for Adam and Village in the traffic ordinance that will be hopefully adopted uh, and then warned this evening, after this evening. Is that... Is so everybody following that logic? Well, not exactly, because I thought you wanted to, to wait and see what effect the signs had before you decided if they were going to be permanent. No. I well, I think we have to put them in the ordinance to put them on. Yeah. Yeah. 
to make them enforceable. Okay. Um, all right, well, <clears throat> so, hold on, yes. What we gotta do is this. Oh, no, Doug, go for it. <laughs> what do we gotta do? We're doing it. Talked about the pond the last person touched it, and they shut me up. Now you want to shut me up for this. You know, I just want to. I just want to move on to the speed conversation on Lightning Ridge. Signs and these, all these little marks you put around them, and all these little the speed signs you got by my place, they're worthless. worthless. They're bogus. Worthless. They tell you nothing. They tell you nothing. And what what we got to do? We got to talk to her husband. And he, is he charge of that more No. <laughs> well, okay. We to right here, right? Talk to somebody about what? The legislature about getting oh, cows, yeah, getting cows, Woodbury, Plainfield, Cabot, and all these to hire a cow to to everybody. I I agree. And everybody yeah. gets beaten, and they don't work every day on the cows. They work different days, and we got to pay them. And you can just put up signs to help us. So <laughs> And we won't do a damn thing. Well, I watched this morning. I watched six, seven cows by my house. Just that fine. Well, I, it, it's, Doug, it's certainly not lost on me that the uh, enforcement is uh, is a thing to to you consider here. Spend your money. If you're going to get anything done. You got to spend some money doing it. Well, thank you, Doug. I um I, I appreciate that, and I and I agree. Um, and I that is on the purview, and there have been conversations. Uh, uh, very initial conversations about maybe uh, looking at partnering with other uh, with other local town or uh, regional towns uh, to split the cost in on enforcement because okay. what we currently have is not enough. So. State troopers and they agree. Yeah, and, that, and so is the sheriff's department. Um, so uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Lightning Ridge Road speed um, because that's the other kind of major okay. uh, substantial change and. Um, do we need any more dialogue uh, around uh, the modification right now? The proposed uh, amendment um, is to uh, reduce the speed uh, from 35 miles an hour uh, to 30 miles an hour. And uh, up at the intersection of Adamant Road and then to Gray Road. That would go. Then it gets to 25 after that. And then after that, 20. After, yeah, correct. School. 25 down and down. Well, right now we're uh, considering this change because uh, because there was a traffic study um, that uh, measured the, the volume and the speeds, um, which is the recommendation of, uh, of CVR, uh, Pete. I can never do the acronym. I'm sorry, Ruben. I just, I can't. It's like a dyslexic thing. I, I it's it's awful um so uh that, that it's uh the methodology that is uh that is recommended um and that's the approach that we've taken uh right now that the majority of the traffic uh is uh is largely split between uh the 30 and 35 uh mile an hour groupings um and uh circulated uh, a reminder um, that there needs to be significant uh, considerations when looking uh, when looking at the reduction of uh, speeds um, because uh, artificially reducing a speed um, uh, too slow can frankly just move more people uh, into the non-compliance and uh, and uh, as a proven record of uh, making people uh, drive more irrationally, not less irrationally. Um, and really it comes down to enforcement, which, you know, is that a fair representation of that guidance, Ruben? Yes, it's the, so the, what you're talking about is um, design speed versus posted speed. And <clears throat> people will uh, tend to drive the design speed of a road kind of regardless of what you post it. So if you have 12 foot lanes and 10 foot shoulders and you post that road at 30 miles an hour, people are still going to do 60 because uh -huh. the geometry of the road tells them to do 60. So, you know, I think um, 
and this is my opinion, and I will afford others the opportunity to um, uh, to present theirs or offer theirs uh, for discussion. But um, uh, we it, we've got uh, speed limits of thirty miles an hour on other uh, roads that are uh, that are similar in uh, in nature and I think in function um, as uh, connectors. Um, uh, the other one being uh, Peak and Brook, um, and uh, the difference uh, between uh, the two. You know, I think that there, well, there's more curb cuts on uh, on Lightning uh, Ridge. Um, there's a school on Lightning Ridge. Uh, there are uh, agricultural properties on uh, on Lightning Ridge, um, uh, and I think that that all taken into consideration warrants a modest uh, modification of the speed limit, um, which at the moment is being proposed for 30 miles an hour. So there, that's that's my piece on that. Um, would anybody else would like to please. go ahead? Yeah, please. So I went back and looked at the study after our conversation last week. Um, and the signs were out, uh, the signs, the, the, the points that were measured in the speed were out for one week, seven days, from August 15th to August 22nd. The 85th percentile came in at 34.9. Now, under the law, uh, a V trans recommendation is that therefore the speed limit should be 35. Now, it may be what Jordan says that because we've lowered it on the roads, we should do that, but we are going to later be taking a look at all these different roads. And if at that time we decide we're going to have a policy of if there's so many curb cuts, well, maybe we can look into changing them. But at this point, I don't see any good justification for not following the recommendation. Uh, and I'm going to vote against changing the speed limit. Sorry, Bill. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, and I, and I think that that uh, raises a uh, a valid point. You know, I um, uh, I want to. I think we should make it you know clear as both a select board and, and a community that um, that that we're not just doing this as a reaction to the squeakiest wheel. Um, it it we did uh, a good faith. We made a good faith effort to uh, get data and make a data driven uh decision uh around this and uh, i think it's okay that there are differing opinions and i think it's important to note that we should not enter into this conversation lightly when we look at other roads and that we should continue to look at what the uh what the influences are of other roads and what the characteristics of them and take them into uh, consideration um uh when we have when we have that information does anybody would anybody else like to offer uh, offer up any other? Yeah, I would. Good put. Yes, Doug. Okay. Uh, we gotta get to talk to the truck drivers when they go around swinging that wing out and getting 30 feet, the ropes 30 feet, 40 feet wide. That's what they do on my road. And I've been down sales road. They don't have no snowbank. They push it. If there's no tree there, no push that's not like right Doug, Doug I don't I don't want to be rude we just have a long agenda tonight and I want to stay uh as focused as we can and we're talking about speed limits so I I, I hear your um oh, can we talk you're concerned about that but we can some yeah yeah absolutely yeah okay um so I'm actually in favor of moving the speed to 30. okay thank you Bill and uh Jamie yeah, do you want to be Amy tonight? I mean, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm generally in favor, although I totally understand mm -hmm. and the point and and see both sides. But I think that there are enough um, sort of evidence and extenuating circumstances that that could easily justify um, being thirty instead of thirty five with the um, traffic in the school and the farm and the number of curb cuts. Can, can I just point out yeah. that the school is in the 25 yeah. mile hour zone? Yes. Yeah. But traffic feeds right. into that zone from somewhere. Okay. With that, uh, I'd like to call for a motion um, to adopt the traffic ordinance as it's proposed. It doesn't sound like we've 
uh, made any uh, changes? Uh, well, would somebody like to make a motion uh, to uh, adopt the edited and modified uh, traffic ordinance with the 30 mile an hour uh, speed limit and uh, the signage in Adamant? Um, Can we divide the question, Jordan? We're not talking about this. I don't know. Record this piece of paper. Well, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
So the ordinance advisory committee could work on that part of it. Too much? No. I mean, it kind of comes yeah, down to when do you want these changes right. uh, implemented? Right. Pretty, if they involve signs, pretty soon. It has to be soon. Well, we're going to wait. You know, there's it's an ordinance, so we're going to wait 44 days after you adopt it, maybe longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if they follow those, it's going to increase down the feet. Never froze last year. So we might, you know, we might be waiting until spring anyway to implement. Can we approve the appropriation of the signage, purchasing of the signage without having the ordinance? Or, uh, I mean, we could buy whatever signs we, we want. Just make that part of this year's program. We were going to install this in the spring. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, is tabling it the will of the majority of the board or? I guess I don't. I mean, I think unless you want to take pieces out of it and vote, like Annie mentioned, I, I think we need to table it. All right, I'm just uh, trying to spin my wheels on how we might be able to do that. And I mean, I really do want to uh, per personally, again, I can't speak for the whole board, but uh, I, I do want to. We made a commitment to uh, taking this up um, prior to uh, you know the broader road related ordinance committee review, and I know that they're going to be taking on uh, other other work. Um, you know, if we need to punt it another two weeks, we can we can do that. Um, I think that that that's fine. I, I mean, I I agree. Uh, I know what that table is because uh, I created it. It's a very nerdy thing, but I also think that it's a uh, it's it's a lot easier to read um, than that. Um, and yeah. in the future, if we needed to make any amendments, it would be easier to do that as a uh, as an appendix with road names. Uh, so structurally, I think it makes a lot of sense as well. Um, so uh, that will let's just m move that to uh, to the next. One other thing is we could do a little more outreach to Adam and. Residents and specifically the co-op. I'd like to hear what they have to say. Uh, okay. That uh, that sounds that sounds good. Uh, that uh, action item is table. Uh, moving on to uh, the land sale discussion, uh, which is the Discussion of uh, oh. just one more comment. You say you're tabling that. Uh, how long is going to be for? Uh, two weeks till the next select board meeting. Uh, to have a fully cleaned up and revised. I mean, I, I think it, it's really just structural revisions at this point, uh, relative to the road names, uh, because there are so many names and numbers. There's a spreadsheet that uh, that I created that. Um, uh, would likely make it easier to read, but but frankly, I, I, I don't see the conversation around the, the speed or signage changing. Um, so uh, it's just would, I would hope that we would by the next meeting have a uh, a final and very clean proposed mm -hmm. proposal that we can just vote on. Um, that would be my expectation for two weeks two weeks from today. Sorry, Michael. Sorry. I was uh, hoping that that would be um, well, the action for tonight. But there's polls already there. Pretty much. There are. Not a lot of work to do. To no. do that. Nope. And get two guys to do it in the day. Nope. We just, uh, right now, the only thing that we're really delaying is the is the warning um, that is going to be another two, two weeks delayed uh, from uh, today. So that would hopefully be my expectation. Thank you. Um, the back to the uh, land sale. Um, so I think there have been some additional conversations uh, with uh, various um, uh, board members. Uh, this is it is an on ongoing consideration. Um, I think uh, the the main thing that we need to discuss is 
what our plan uh, is going to be moving forward for uh, doing a, a thorough assessment of this and making preparations to uh, get um, sufficient information out to the community. Um, uh, because the, the plan would be that if this would be a uh, an item that is brought up for uh, vote during town meeting. So there has to be a certain amount of coordination with the warning of town meeting um, and some due diligence um, in the interim that uh, that uh, needs to be addressed sooner than later because we're going to be coming up on deadlines pretty quickly. Um, and uh, what I would like to put forth as an option uh, would be to volunteer myself uh, as tribute for further <laughs> torture and abuse. Um, and uh, the um, as a li liaison to this issue, uh, to serve as a, a board liaison to this issue, um, to work with various community members um, to put forth a uh, an assessment and proposal um, uh, for considering the purchase um, that would then be presented uh, at town meeting or, or frankly, before. Um, it, it may make sense to do it beforehand, but I would, I guess, need to look to others for some input on what what the timeline of that would, would be. Is that clear? Seems we we ought to um, have the time to brainstorm what questions we think are likely to come up at town meeting, so we yeah. know what questions need to be answered. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can think of a few, but I'm sure I can't think of all of them. Uh, so that is a fair point. Let's uh, let's I think let's raise a couple of questions. Um, so you know, I think one of the major ones is um, usage. Um, so one of the, one of the primary proposed usages would be um, for uh, producing uh, crushed material uh, for uh, for the town's use, um, whether that be uh, through crushing what is on site or uh, uh, getting a uh, updated permit that would allow the town to uh, to crush. Um, uh, there's also the consideration of uh, potentially using it as, as purely a bulk storage uh, facility. Um, uh, there's uh, some uh, questions around uh, natural resources that uh, should be taken into consideration and uh, should be presented, I think, to the, to the community for consideration. Um, uh, there's personally, I think that there may be an opportunity to look into uh, whether whether or not it makes sense from the acquisition opportunity to try to start piecing together a uh, a continuous block a contiguous block of town forests, whether that be for conservation purposes or trail usage. I mean, I, I don't think it's a reach for uh, for there to be tra a trail network that connects Adamant Village to uh, to Maple Corner. Um, uh, there's only a handful of properties that would probably need to be involved in that conversation. Uh, and that could be a pretty cool resource for the community. Um, so, you know, those, those are the ones that are on top of my list. Are there, are there other um, calculus or questions on the board? Oh, yeah. I, I would like to understand the finances. Mm. Um, I think it might be good if we asked, Probably the listers, you know, just what's the appraisal value of the property? You know, what are they appraising the property at? Um, I realize the Peltex are offering us a wonderful deal, but I think people are going to want to know the specifics of mm -hmm. what's it worth. I want to understand the finances of if we were to try to operate it so that we were crushing gravel, what are the finances of that? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know more about the forest management plan. I'd like to know what you know. What is it, and where are we in the cycle? Are we likely to actually be able to earn some money from continuing the forest management plan? Um, those are off the top of my head. Also on the finance and the uh, what's lost in tax revenue by removing it from the grand list. Six hundred. 
500 bucks, 1500 bucks. Just so that's, that's in the, not that's much, but it needs to be in the calculus. That'll be in that'll be in the calculus. Uh, tax revenue. Um, there. Any? Yeah, you will have. It'd be good to have to understand the potential for for, for the gravel too. Somebody who knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, Greg knows a lot. Maybe he can help with that. I um, think. Yeah. You know, it, people are going to say, okay, let's suppose we offer this to gravel pits. How long are we going to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, say, I might say one statement as you can make the right for me to keep amending it. Um, I would say almost everybody in this room will be pushing pansies before them. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not looking for answers now. We're just trying to get, get out the questions that are likely to come at us at uh, okay. town meeting. Um, I think people will want to know Go ahead. Please. something about the, how the business of gravel crushing would operate and what the impacts would be, the noise, the air, the water, that kind of thing. People are going to want to know more about the vernal pool. What does that mean? What if suddenly everybody knows there's this magnificent vernal pool there? Do we need to worry about protecting it? Should we run a trail by it? Um, to understand what yeah yeah more about the property more about the property yeah yeah um do we want to look into the potential for the solar operation that greg has and rose have mentioned okay yeah. uh i think that that's you know, I'm just trying to. I think all of those are are valid considerations and ones that we need to define and take a look at. Yeah, you know, I see this as an opportunity to kind of split it into uh, a handful of different categories of consideration. Um, uh, a you know Venn diagram of sorts, uh, pluses and minuses. If we use it for crushing, what does that keep us from from using it from uh, for in the future? You know, how valuable are the natural resources? Um, you know, how do they weigh compared to maybe some of the other natural resources uh, and, and conservation efforts that, that might be a higher priority um, uh, around uh, the rest of the community? Um, and, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, if I were to li liaise that operation, I, I would pull in experts in, in each of those and, and kind of task, uh, uh, task individuals with, uh, with helping to structure the input around that. Um, seek ex expertise on that you know so i think that it would absolutely make sense to get the town forester involved uh you know we have other folks who are uh who are particularly attuned um to to weighing some of those considerations um and making those representations and then um and then i would i would own the presentation of that uh of that input i guess um once it's all correlated um scott sorry oh, thank you in the more than 20 years that I've been uh, really hoping that something like this would happen for the town of Calus, um, I what the, the major benefit to me is that we would spend a lot less time being in the trucking business. Yeah, yeah. So as you're gathering your data, um, what's a, how many miles do you go? What kind of Material, what's the ton of material cost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's, what's a ton of material going to cost in 10 years? Um, it's getting harder and harder to get material as we learned in the flood. Um, and um, what would a ton of material from the quarry? There's a lot of variables there now and in 10 years. And what are they doing? I said, what are they doing? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I absolutely agree that, that, that transportation and, and material, projected material, material availability and expense needs to be, uh, needs to be weighed uh, with, with this. Um, diesel, cost of tires, cost of land, wheelers versus two wheelers. 
I mean, hopefully at some point they make electric trucks, right? You know, that, uh, that will be able to, I mean, it seems like it's a stretch for electric triaxles, but, you know, maybe we'll get there. Um, hold on, Craig, uh, because there's a hand up in the back that I, I want that, uh, that was first. Yeah, and then I'll come to you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, from my understanding, there's two uh, ways in. There's one from county and there's one that hasn't been made yet from Bosque Pond Road. Which I live on a neighboring side of that, but uh, I think that would be a tremendous cost to cut in the road from there. Mm -hmm. And also, like just the, the wildlife corridor that comes through. I just saw, and this is like the third time I saw a beautiful bull moose just make its way through there once in the last week. Um, and then, yeah, just all sorts of other bear and fox and coyotes. And, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's certainly not um, not lost on me for sure. And and I though, I'm not yeah. I'm not quite following how that would help, like how that would work. Um, is that a concern? I think I think none of those ways in are oh, oh, just the one from Bruce Pond Road is owned by the Bob Trucks, not the the other way in town. Yeah, so I you know I think we we would have to. Well, so we would have to look at the um, the easement from County Road um, to make sure that we're not going to have any uh, any disruption of access to that somehow solidify that in in any kind of dialogue. I, I agree that I I it would be a, we would want to make sure that we don't have uh, if we were going to be using it for truck access or crushing like that 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 we don't have some sort of lingering liability that would box us into having to develop a road off of Bliss Ponds. You know, that yeah. that certainly is not the initial expectation by any stretch of the imagination. And right now there's a the a property owner there who uh, who hasn't made that raised that as a concern for us. So um uh and and you know I think to to your point, I'm I don't think that this isn't uh, have your cake and eat it too conversation too. Like I, I, we may be able to do both. We may be able to use it for uh, municipal storage, and we may be able to use a portion of it um, or conserve a portion of it or manage a portion of it as as forest and, and a trail network. But I think what we need to do is is solicit uh, the expertise of a number of, of folks and and take all of those uh, into into consideration and make sure that that's all represented uh, to the voters. Uh, Craig? Thank you. No, why is in the back of my head. No. You raised some good points. Yeah. Uh, as I was leaving, I saw yet again the scene five bears in my lawn climbing my apple trees. <laughs> and they've been around for three to four weeks every day, every night. One day, I'm sorry, this is off the cuff. I counted 33 piles of bear shit from one night. And a guy stopped, they moved through, they're across the road, they're down at Kent's Corner. Um, it's, it's heavy wildlife use. What I wanted to ask was, well, first of all, to say I really appreciate the careful consideration that you folks are giving this. Um, that's part of the reason I came tonight, a big part of the reason. Um, I well remember the debate that went on, as Greg and Rose do, how many years ago? Um, we started, we started yeah. trying to know it. Yeah, and so the, the debate about the pros and cons and the noise and uh, um, and and I was coming down ultimately on the side of no, let's not do it. And um, and yet once it was operational, I, I didn't have any issues. There's a lot more to it now. I think that you're considering, <clears throat> which is great. My question is. Is there any information already put together that people could look at? I'm interested to learn more. I don't know how many acres it is. I don't, you know, is there anything where I can learn more? Uh, not at the 45 acres. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's it's forty it's forty five uh, acres. It's uh, owned by the Chuck, L Chucks. Uh, you know anybody can find them and ask them questions about the parcel. But they've been pretty they've been pretty uh, forthright and uh, their representation of it. Um, 
Uh, but well, stay, tuned. Let, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. I'd, I'd like to organize that a little bit more. Yeah. It's not feasible to bring any type of equipment in and out yeah. there. It was basically going out to County Road. The yeah. County Road was your main thoroughfare in yeah. and out. And when we had the flood, but not this year, but last year, and I was bringing a lot of material up there to stockpile and transfer it to an Adamant Village yeah. so they could build things quickly. Yeah. One question that driveway. Just looking at it from the road is relatively small. Is that adequate for the size that's, dump truck? Yeah, that's, that's I mean, that's a CB radios and your trucks and your guys talk to each other because we didn't have any issues during the July 23 flood. The big the trucks, trucks coming in and out. Of the that. current curb cut is up to the uh, the commercial standard okay. for uh, curb cuts that is defined by the side. It's a, it's a uh, yeah, B, B71A. Um, yeah, it's got to be either B seventy one A or B seventy one B. So, uh, and it's and it's an A. It's a, the commercially rated one, uh, including yeah. Anyway, so yeah, be stay tuned. And so with that, um, I if, uh, like to put forth the uh, uh, motion to appoint um, myself. Uh, as liaison uh, to start pulling together this information um, and get it to the public in preparation for a vote in town meeting. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, okay. Nobody tell my wife, please. <laughs> I, I had another thought uh, that the permit situation should be looked into too. Oh, yeah, I have that on. Yeah. I, it, I, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable with deciding that you now have a comprehensive question list. Those right. are just things that I was thinking of off the top of my head. I wonder if we shouldn't think of a way to be sure we're hearing what the people of Callis are going to want to know at town. Meeting. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. You right. know what? There's another person who has a lot of experience with doing town run surveys, and uh, maybe uh, one of the individuals I could uh, <laughs> ask for helping facilitate some initial input. Don't got one? No. <laughs> She might be <laughs> um, so why don't, why don't we do a survey, an initial survey, uh, try to get um, some poll information. What people want to know. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, maybe we could do that next, like for next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. good idea. Let's do that. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Uh, aye. All any opposed? Nay, just because I can. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, we we have a scheduled quick break, but we're <laughs> running behind schedule by twenty minutes. Um, how do we want to handle that? Uh, an extremely quick. While we work. Yeah, we can eat while we while we work. If you guys can uh, put up with some chewy mouth while we try to consume some food while we move through the rest of the agenda. Try. We were we were like ahead, but just like a little bit, and then we had that extra twenty minutes. Who? Oh, you definitely voted on Toby. Yeah, I remember. I wrote it down. You wrote it down. Yep. Who, who was saying that? Oh. I, I, I proposed it, and Jamie said it. It was unanimous. Okay. I know all of it. I've known it for minutes. Oh, so you get them all. I mean. My, my, my husband doesn't want to have a coffee box. Like, like, you don't have to. Oh, yeah. Well, I haven't gone hungry a day in my life. We videotape on all the time.
We don't see Charlie being in the world. I mean, it's just a Traffic study. If you go into the share drive and just do a search, oh, it'll travel right on the top and just do um, traffic study yeah. or speed just study, maybe. The, I, think it does come up. I think you'd have to kind of speed study. I tried traffic. Oh, I did Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in the uh, so in the interest of time, Kari uh, and Rose, I I I think we we ought to just kind of keep rolling. Back to work, everyone, please. I. I I think so. I have a very competitive and anxious uh, pizza eating, uh, so I've already piled my plate high. Um, leftover. 
Yeah. So the next agenda item on the list is the uh, update from the Planning Commission. Greg. What? Come on. Um, uh, so the Planning Commission has an update on town plan, uh, and tonight we uh, have the agriculture and flood, uh, flood resiliency elements, um, as well as a dialogue uh, about um, uh, adopting timelines and that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, Jared, would you like to start? Or no, would... I, I can't. I actually, I'd say the first is we welcome any questions or comments about either the sections. Vicki mm -hmm. is here. He wrote the flood resilience section. Uh, Gary was going to be here, but I don't see Gary. Um, so I can at least take any questions you have about agriculture and take them back to him. And then, and then after we do that, we can take uh, we can give you a little bit of update on where we are and what we're what our plan looks like from here on out. Um, so, you know, in the previous um, iterations of these updates, uh, we've had kind of a 30,000 foot view um, a presentation of, uh, of of what any major changes uh, have been. And for many of them, they've been uh, just kind of uh, st structural um, in and some more substantive. So I guess for the agriculture, um, do can we have just kind of a, a general update of the more significant changes for the community members that are here? Yeah, so uh, the, the real significant changes are, I shouldn't say changes, but the focus is on how do we support um, agriculture as we have it and as we know that it will be, which is more small based, right, farms and those kind of things, supporting the, um, the bigger farms that we do have, and finding ways to incentivize um, protecting farmland and agricultural land and land that's being used for growing food and cattle and those types of things, uh, protecting that. And I think that is the biggest takeaway that I got. And if you let me know if you did, was it was it was the protection of and how do we help not just protect but at least grow what we can. We only have so much. Right, farmland and so many places that we can do that. And so how do we protect what we have um, and help grow that where we can, but also supporting uh, small scale and a lot of the different things that we have. Gary has been like visiting all of them to talk to them. You know, he's been going around where he can and talking to people, schoolhouse farm, Uli Flats, like he's going to those places and asking, um, you know, their thoughts and what things they need. Um, and so that's really the, the part of the plan is just focusing on protecting what we have and helping to maintain it and grow it while at the same time sort of pushing into this the smaller farming and the, the, the medium size um, agricultural industry that we have. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Anne. Um, first of all, it, it, are you going to be edited? Yes, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, in the part about taxes, yeah, you, there, there's a, a statement that um, the, that uh, I need to find so I can read it. Let me just find it here. Um, well, it, it, it was about um, how the taxes. Um, in... uh, I mean, the first the, the first sentence is, uh, is is an awkward one. The challenge of how property tax uh, oh. properly tax farmland has been with us for a generation. It's, it's the last sentence yep. in that uh, section. Tax stabilization for farms is expensive, unequally supports large landowners, and here's the part of the questioning: mm -hmm. reduces the incentive for innovation and modernization. And imposes government oversight on land use. How does it reduce the incentive for innovation and modernization? It seems to me just the opposite. Right. We we talked a lot about this when this was the part of the this section that was not well gone through that he had questions to us about. 
okay. as he was writing. Okay. So that that one needs that is the section we need to go through more like that. That was one that we did not even really get clear answers on. Okay. So we're willing to take any thoughts okay. you have on that because that one was one where Gary was sort of like, I'm not, not quite sure exactly where we want to go with this and how we should go with this. So no, that's okay. Well, I actually think that's wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> When you said that was the last sentence in that tax section. It, it, it's it's the last the first first paragraph. Paragraph. First. Last sentence in the first paragraph. Right. Did comments on the floor? Um uh, well, Daniel, before you offer yours, I would like to offer one and, and say that, you know, I think that um that strikes me as a problematic like statement without data to back it up, you know, on what right. authority has anybody said that? And right. um, I, I think that that would be feedback, you know, in any section of the town plan. We, I think we, as a community, need to be more careful about how we make those those uh, statements and, and backing them up with with a rationale and 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 the information um, or data. But Daniel, uh, you've got a fair amount of expertise in working with uh, <laughs> rural farmers. Well, and... I was just going to say, I mean, I, I agree with the data. I, mean, I think the data is important. Backing it up, but I I see some validity in that, just in in terms of the fact that if someone is reliant on the use value appraisal program mm -hmm. to reduce their taxes, they're going to take the path of least resistance very often, which is working with the bigger conventional farms. Mm -hmm. There's There needs to be a guarantee that the farmer benefiting from the land is someone who's earning 50% or more of their income from farming, which I think disqualifies a lot of new and emerging farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also a lot of small and livestock farms can't utilize the fields to their highest and best use if they're not fenced. And right. there's very little, very little land farmland in, in our town that, that is fenced. Most mm -hmm. of it is sort of open hayland. So I think well, there's some aspects to how it might hinder innovation. Mm -hmm. But the data is important. And I'm right. I'm curious what the farmers said. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, some bigger farms in East Montana that have been able to take advantage of it to be in mm -hmm. So, I just, yeah. Well, I'm not, I guess my question here is how much leeway or power does the town of Calais have in determining how farmland is going to be attacked? That was a lot of our discussion. Because this is a town plan, yes. so let's yes. figure out what the town can do. Correct. Right? That was exact. That was actually most of the conversation right. was like, really, what? Yeah. What taxing power do we even have? Like, not really. Well, and so it was more of a, other than the land, right? Like, but it was more of a, how do we then find ways to help and incentivize right. from a town perspective when right. we only have so many tools available. Right. To us as the town. That was that so let's major look at discussion, correct? What those are. Yeah. But I presume we could be a resource. We oh, are absolutely. helping people understand yes. what tax um, right. incentives are available and how they would go about doing this. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that we, we've also been touching on quite a bit in, uh, in the review of, of many of these sections is um, um, trying to uh, define what kind of actions the community will Correct. be taking to um, to support the values that we're defining uh, without getting too nuanced with deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, one of the one of the things, these are also records of a point in time, um, which, uh, which, you know, I think is a, uh, is an interesting uh, way to look at them as well. So under the marketing processing and storage part, I, I'm wondering if we can speak more specifically about uh, the, you know, the community stores uh, that are, that are in our town and uh, that have relationships or, or try to mm -hmm. emphasize the use or make accessible the, uh, the purchase of locally grown and produced agricultural products. 
for outputs. Um, and in general, if I were to think about some of the younger farmers, um, some of them aren't necessarily from around here, uh, and many of them are younger and maybe don't have farming in their background, but have chosen to walk a certain um, path in their life, uh, which I think is very honorable. Um, and I wonder if we uh, could make a commitment uh, to having like a, an, uh, an agricultural advisory committee or some sort of agricultural you know, re, uh, some sort of support committee, uh, resource co committee. Maybe if it's not a committee, it's just a, a part of a place on the website where we can get together a, a, a cohort of individuals uh, who can make a list of resources that are available to um, to landowners who are pursuing various agricultural pursuits. Yeah. I mean, that's we found that in a lot of places where that's what it needs to be, like economic development. We talked about right. that one way back. Right. It was like having a, a business advisory or a collaborative <laughs> or something together, just where they resources together, mm -hmm. right? Working together in the same, I mean, that could be that. Farms are businesses, right? These are our businesses, so it could be something like that. But you're saying something specific, which I like. So. I remember when Rachel was here, she recommended a housing committee. Right. Mm -hmm. She did, yeah. That's a whole other like a whole way to bring that in. Yes. Yeah, and again, I don't, <clears throat> I don't necessarily think it it needs to be a full on committee, but it, right. you know, I think we know who certain players are in the community who who have a fair amount of a authority and knowledge on the matter and could help kind of stand up a resource center um, of sorts, um, and and make a commitment as a community to publicizing that mm -hmm. and making it accessible. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, that's pretty much you. Uh, that's I think. I just wrote in here. Gary needs to talk to Daniel. <laughs> that's what I wrote. Um. Okay. Can I ask another question? Yeah. So I'm looking at the, the paragraph that's one sentence. It says one major landowner reports renting houses that share agricultural lots to generate income in a hybrid business plan to offset the cost of taxes. What is that? That's a fair question. There's one sentence in a one at one paragraph. I'm reading it. There's one paragraph. One major landowner reports renting houses that share agricultural lots to generate income in a hybrid business plan to offset the cost of taxes. I don't understand. So the like sentence. sharing land to grow or renting houses that share agricultural lots. How does that offset the cost of taxes? I, I'm, Anyway, okay. Just I mean, I can. Ask, I I will ask. I just find that. No, I mean, that is a good. That is a good question. Yeah. Maybe it means to share the burden of having to pay the taxes that's, by. That's what I take from it. Not, is that it means like instead of me being the landowner owning this all land, I share the tax with somebody. So if it's right, so it's not. It's, it's not right, but I want. Reducing the taxes oh. to the town of Callis is reducing somebody's that. burden. How about pay it? Oh, we okay. share it's shared four ways. Oh, yeah. Right? Like if we share out. Maybe it's interesting to help isn't financially in general. That's more I think that's I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. And in the next paragraph, it says the town has adopted density averaging. <coughs> I thought you were getting rid of that. Am I wrong? Density averaging? Right. Are you taking that out? I don't think you can. No, I don't no, think. that's still no, there. It's still, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I will check on that though. Yeah, get that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, any any more uh, discussion of the agriculture section? Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's a bunch of language about mapping, but, but I can't quite tell how it is you plan to use the mapping. Um. I need to find. We talked about that a lot. We did. Oh, we did talk about a lot. That. Um. <laughs> What is it? Yeah. So I'm trying to do. I I know one of them was, you know, they they have like the USDA soil maps, and we want to look and see how much land in Cal's actually has prime soil for farming, and then um, maybe propose ways to, um, you know, preserve that land specifically for farming because of the soil types. Um, you know, and other things like 
um, you know, steepness and slope, or is it forested or not? You know, just um, to use maps to determine what areas are best for farming and how we can uh, try to save those areas specifically for farming and not other types of. So, isn't that also the land where it's cheapest to build housing in general, where you can get good septic and the infrastructure is easy to build. I know that's like the big problem. You're, 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 yeah, you're in the same way to flood plains, that's where it's flat. Um, it's it's a big problem. So it's um it's just one way to we have to look at everything and I guess it, you also there's the question of how much land in health actually has this good soil because right. um there's really I don't think there's all that many areas. And like you're saying that there's not that many great areas to build too because there's all these rocky ridges and Deep elevation. So I think just having the maps, um, the mapping, which um, I know they're working on, right? Because we, yeah, yeah, they're working on the maps. They aren't. It, it's not the same as prime egg soil, which I thought was all now. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, for for like the maps for us to have in the plan, it is the same. They just haven't, I guess, finalized the the data. So those are that's what they mean by that. And we had a whole discussion. And they'll be maps for I think almost every section, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Most of them. John, you, you know maps a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. You're working you know, on the maps. Does all that sound? Yeah. And, and if you haven't seen the uh, the new map, the CAI map, mm -hmm. uh, there's a very complete mapping of soils in Calus. But, and to your point, that is one of the things that we're finding that there are things like are finite, finite resources. Right. Right, like that's part of our problem. Right. So where there is agricultural land that can be used, it's also the place where you could build, but it could also be the place that would be well, in flood. And well, that's what the maps are for. And that's what the maps are for, so that we can say, this is what this should be used for, and this is what this should and be And if it's for. prime agricultural land, maybe it's not Correct. appropriate for housing. Correct. Okay. Maps are good. Maps are good. We like maps. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I really do think that having having maps that help define the um, the priorities for any any of these things, uh, I've, I've said this before, makes makes a lot of sense. I uh, I think the agricultural an agricultural overlay or or soils map is um, it, it yeah it it should be. Committed, I just or resources should be you know committed to trying to get one stood up. I just don't know how much of an impact it's going to be because it's like such a dynamic and and also it, it's a little different than some of the other situations because um, because there's only so much that we can do to control somebody's use of uh, use of land or direct them to use it for agricultural use um, um, because you know that person is going to have to want to be a farmer, right? And so uh, it, you know I. I guess I would just be careful. It seems to me like if we're going to spin up resources and efforts, you know, we need to help farmers get their outputs and products, you know, to the community members or accessible to the community members. Um, you know, how do we support them? And that that seems like more of an ec economic development approach um, than than like identifying land and saying this needs to be used for. Uh, for agricultural purposes, you know, I think uh, it it will be it would be helpful for certainly like the DRB when they're uh, reviewing things. But my guess is that that agricultural overlay district or not district, but you know, resource map is going to look very similar to uh, the uh, river corridor map. You know, for instance, and you know, it's going to come with it, its own inherent limitations and challenges. Um, in terms of, like that's what we need to pass the plan, so that's why they're being oh. added. And I believe they're the ones who are actually helping with maps. So oh, okay, good. Using resources. To that's do interesting. This, not looking to be enforced, it's, um, you know, for the town planning purposes and mm -hmm. to help us determine if we want to focus on agriculture. Or maybe that's you know not going anywhere. We need to focus on housing, but it's just to help inform us to make better decisions. Yeah, yeah. I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I was just kind of a thought exercise, but we used to have a callus tax um, incentive for farmers mm -hmm. on top of the state tax incentive. It has been mentioned. Yeah, Gary yeah. has mentioned it, John oh, has mentioned it, yeah. Are you aware of it? Yeah. That was done away with yeah. I know. 15 years ago, maybe. Yeah. I know. <clears throat> um, there were, uh, Doug Lilly, yeah. I mean, there were like two farmers 
Mm -hmm. using it. I remember it. Well, I know. Yeah. And Doug just said that he wants us to charge him more taxes so that we can uh, hire constables. So, uh, so I'm not saying he's going to want it anyway. We're going to have to ra raise it so egregiously to offset the uh, offset. The offset. Um, <laughs> that, <laughs> sorry, that's not fair. It wasn't brought up, and it was, but it went into that bigger discussion of what is our role and what like, what should we do. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if that goes back into the economic development conversation I think that because is more there actually. This is something that was raised relative to like how do we incentivize, how do we right. support, you know, and how do we right. do that in a way that is uh, driven by you know some sort of prioritization or opportunity, um, uh, opportunity that's been recognized. Like, so do we need to create a special tax incentive uh, for in a, a period of time for? Right. Subdividing, subdividing within villages or ADUs within villages, et cetera, et cetera. And can we do that as a uh, as a municipality to try to incentivize people to use land in a particular way? As right. I mean, to... I even had it suggested to me at the opposite end. It's not incentivizing the producer because they're there and small, but it's incentivizing getting it into local stores mm -hmm. somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Like incentivizing the getting it to market in the community. Mm -hmm incentivizing that because they're already doing the thing it helps them more to sell their product than it does to incentivize on the front end on the back end so but that's more of an economic development issue but it's also where the two come together we've got to find a way to word the agricultural section so that it meets the economic development section as well um do you think we can uh, table the rest of any, any other conversation on that and move on to um, the flood resiliency? Uh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know how to do this diplomatically anymore. And... <laughs> <laughs> Just look at the clock. That way, I don't, I don't know yeah, if I'm, yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> you just keep looking at the clock. <clears throat> um, Vicky, here's the edge. So, Vicky, do you want to uh, do uh, an intro to the flood resilient? Sure. Uh, so, I just for this. Um... So it's a very uh, rough draft. I really wanted to hear more from this conversation, hear your questions for before. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time making this beautiful looking or lots of, you know, charts and all that kind of stuff. And it's still very much so a work in progress. I looked online, there aren't that many town plans that have been approved since the flooding, the July flooding, you know. Um, so I was really curious to see what other people have done since that event. And um, a lot of the town plans, you know, that have been recently approved, they don't really reflect that information. It's also recent. I also want to point out that our, you know, floodplain ordinance in our river corridor, um, that's, I think we're one of like three or four towns in the state of Vermont that has adopted the river corridor ordinance. Okay. So I also just want to reiterate, like the things that actually um, you can use to, um, you know, regulate construction and development in the floodplain, we have a really strong set of ordinances and laws on our side. And also, you know, I think in the last flood, it was mostly, um, you know, road infrastructure, you know, the dam that it wasn't necessarily homes that were significantly damaged. So when I, and I also have a background with FEMA and FIP and the map making, that's why I volunteered to do this. But um, so I feel like when I, my, my thoughts with this is, it's really long. Most town plans are not this long. Most of their flood sections are a couple paragraphs and that or maybe like three or four pages and that includes large photos. <laughs> so ours is longer, but that's okay. Um, so I'm just pointing out, um, you know, we can definitely cut back a lot, but I, I think the most important parts in my opinion for this are uh, making sure that it enables us to be eligible for whatever funding for, you know, um, dams like you know, rehabilitating dams or removing dams and um, road construction, getting funding to improve our roads, culvert sizes, whatever we need to do. Um, so I think those are my two thoughts for where I'd like this to go. I feel like we, don't, we have so few people with flood insurance in the town and the whole flood insurance program is like rapidly changing at the moment. So that's very, like, if I write this in eight years, it's the whole flood insurance program is gonna be different anyway, it won't matter. And um, I guess like those are my, just like my priorities um, that I feel from my, I guess, personal experience, but I wasn't, I'm just here to answer questions and um, that's the background of the current status of it. I wonder if we could, 
again, you know, I think it's a valid point. I do part of what we want to be doing through this process is making these documents accessible. And uh, if they don't seem accessible when they're, you know, so long, um, certainly for the people who don't read good. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I wonder if like, this might be like a good opportunity to dedicate some of this like historical information to a section of the website and then have it linked to in the document so that you know that that becomes the the record of flooding events and the quantitative information without having to uh, use up town plan and uh, space and then maybe that affords more room for talking about like the <clears throat> uh things about like like road maintenance so that we want to make sure that we're staying uh, ahead of it it just gives us a little bit more um space i think to to list what our priorities are going to be or again like action items I'm try not to use the same words over no. and over again but um you know i, I think some of that information it, like historical information, especially, especially with like the 2023 flooding um, is impactful with the 1.7 million. Um, I, there may be like some sort of balance that needs to be struck on, on what stays in and what stays out. But like, I think it'd be helpful just to have something that is linked to the town website and, um, and then, and then maybe doesn't um, kind of recur have to get reviewed and regurgitated uh, every time we we look at this, um, or not every time, but on on the occasions that we look at it. I think it's a good idea. There's a lot of great information. There. It's awesome information. And it, it'd yeah. be nice to like have it somewhere. Um, yeah. These are my only concerns with the financial history. Mm. I don't know. I haven't lived here that long, uh, but I don't know you know, what, how the, how this section of the town plan helps with getting, you know, money from the state and whatnot. And if they need to know those figures from the past, like historically flooding has caused this many millions of dollars in damage in Calais, if that's something they need to have in the town plan. Um, so we can, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly. That's my only reason for keeping that in and making sure it was there. But the other thing is that I also forgot to mention is we have our hazard mitigation plan, which is, you know, the federal humor requirement, and almost all of this information is also in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's this is just kind of combining what's in the hazard mitigation plan, what's in our ordinance, and I guess, you know, maybe some of our goals. It's that's kind of what the section is, but it's all, I think, in my opinion, stated elsewhere in, um, you know, official or in my opinion, more official documents. So I guess I'd say there again, I think that maybe that's our, our, our opportunity to link specifically to those. And what we're saying in these sections is we will have a hazard uh, hazard mitigation plan and and have a link specifically to that because we do have that resource that exists. And um, we will keep record of the impacts and costs associated um, with flooding events um, because because we do, we have to. Um, and, and frankly, we're one of the communities that's pretty good at it. <laughs> uh, the, <clears throat> I think we do really well. I don't know. I also work with a lot of sharks. I, don't, I work all over the country with this, so I think we're really good, but uh, wow. Can we quote you on that? <laughs> I think you would agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> So I think what you're suggesting is is we can sort of refer in the plan, we're talking about the town plan, to all these other places where we've done all this work. Yeah. And then the town plan has our goals, our goals right. mitigate risks, and, and here's our action steps, and here's our stormwater management, and here's our action steps, the stuff you have at the end of the document. Yeah, the other one is the, the Curtis Pond Emergency Action Plan. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like, And I did my best to reference a lot uh, but before I just started deleting a lot of things, I also just wanted to um, mm -hmm. hear everyone's opinion. Um. Uh, no, I heard gas from either whichever. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, gas, but this one's no, 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 just uh, moments. Of, yeah, sorry. I agree with your sort of prioritization of dams and roads. Just it's, it's inevitably what we're going to prioritize. And with dams, I think. We need to be thinking down the road. You know, it's great that we're taking care of Curtis, but basically we should have a plan for every single dam um, in right. town. You know, ne hopefully next will be the decommissioning or the Moscow. removal of Moscow Woods. But 
all of them within within I don't know a couple decades I would think would need some need to be addressed. And on the roads, I think one strategy that we're you know going to start to adopt. I mean, I think we already have, but getting even more proactive about getting ready for the next flood. So when they hit, we know what size culvert is appropriate for right. that damaged road segment mm -hmm. so that we can have FEMA pay for it. And I, I think, you know, you have to have, you have, to have <coughs> preparation in place in order to do that. And we're, we're seeing that um, if, if you're ready, I, I think you can put that resource to good use. It, it actually can be pretty beneficial. And the third thing I was going to mention, if you're looking for something innovative, I just had a very interesting conversation with a uh, newly returned to Calus resident, uh, Trey Martin. He lives on... I bought his house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he seems to be very in touch with what is what a lot of people are thinking about at the state level of how do we mitigate flooding down in the valleys, down lower, mm -hmm. you start in the uplands and places like Calus and how do you spread the water <laughs> So that it's not so concentrated by the time it hits the Kingsbury and, yeah. and the Winooski. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I don't know that much about it, but he certainly does. And he's pretty know. excited about it. And he, he was indicating that there'll be resources available for places like Cal's that are willing to at least try some innovative approaches to creating, yeah. like engineering. Little, little like creating wetlands place. basically yeah. is what it is. Yeah. I'm laughing because I think on our property we have a wetland area, mm -hmm. and I think his kids and him dug like a trench to make the stream faster. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. But um, it was harmless. I'm just laughing. It was very small area. Um, um, Karen, are we doing anything differently with our roads now because of the floods? Are we engineering those in any different way now? Or should we we're upgrading about? culverts mainly. Other and, than and, culverts, yeah. Yeah, that's, so you're, that's, you're not constructing the roads differently, <laughs> ditching more maybe. Well, ditching, ditching is certainly it. So if you're seeing like where you live, on yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Marshfield, uh, East Hill, those ditches which are being paid for by the state through the grant mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. they are much deeper, they're lined with stone. This yeah, is what the state expects are, now. So should that be part of the plan too, that we're gonna do more of that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. I mean yeah. 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 And again, I would want to uh, take a look at the road standard. Yeah, well <laughs> sure. One conversation all the time. Are the road standards, I think when I looked at the state website, they're from twenty fourteen. They were readopted in 2014. So the uh, road standards that we uh, have are a modified road standard that were adopted in 2015 after some uh, an organization of uh, uh, community members uh, who gave input in kind of form, forming and adopting a modified road standard. And that was initially uh, sent to the state for uh, review and, and approval, essentially. Um, uh, and so it it we've made incremental changes to it, um, but it's a it's a it's a topic with a lot of history in the town. Um, so and, I was a little hesitant to put a lot about. Well, that. so that's I think what we we should do, and to Kari's point and Anne's point, I think is to to keep the language in in the plan about you know a commitment to um, in investigating. Uh, infrastructure management practices uh, that help mitigate the risk of uh, flooding and uh, sediment um, displacement, et cetera, et cetera, um, and not, uh, you know, through the use of or adoption of road standards. I mean, the, the state mm -hmm. has an obligation to have road standards, whether you adopt the state's or your own as a community, and that's what makes you... Um, uh, eligible for the grants that um, that largely support the budgets for our roads. Um, um, so I, I think if we keep the language uh, more more generic without getting into the specific actions that we're going to do, because that those are the those are the things that change and evolve as as conditions do. The other thing that I just did a control F and I didn't see the phrasing uh, the phrase climate change anywhere in there um, and. Uh, I wonder if we should at least acknowledge that in the what are the flood risks uh, as we define how how we got here. That's um, a good point. I think that totally like went by me for a minute. Depending on like 
the administration of my work for FEMA, we either talk about it or we don't. So um, I'll uh, make sure to add that at the point. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that most people in Calis are going yes. to be strongly in favor of having that language in there. Totally I, mean, I think that's what happens on that is we all just yeah. kind of just just assume that that's the right. problem. Right. We know. Right. I mean, but yeah. we do need to mention it because if we don't, then we think they call it I think they call it signaling <clears throat> is yeah. what that is. Uh, virtue signaling. Yep, sorry. Um uh, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, just a quick note on the local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, the last edition of that was uh, from 2021. It's updated every five years, and so we are updating it for 2026. And so it'd be great to get uh, the additional information that's been compiled if we want to move some of that into the local hazard mitigation plan, we can. But just to note that it's not a document that's updated every year. And so as we have more events, just thinking about where we're going to archive this information in the intermediate five year spans so that we update the hazard mitigation plan. Yeah. Uh, just uh, wanted to throw that in your shot there. Scott. Does FEMA have online programs for hazard mitigation? Sort of them, would it really make sense for us to try to add into some of that expertise and funding? So <clears throat> um that is like the goal for everyone it's a really complicated process to apply for those grants i feel like we look at them really oh no no no. i mean they're up they're up there there i mean we look at them i think uh, there's like public there's a bunch of them um but they i guess the channel can apply so what it, it would be is you apply to the state um, the state officer yeah that's yeah. how you would go through that um not you can get like guidance from FEMA, but generally FEMA goes to the state and yeah. then you get guidance from the state, and that's how you apply. And then I I don't know how much money they've released yet for 2025. Like there's documents you can see it all and everything, but um they have to do like a benefit cost analysis. There's like there are a lot of things that you have to do and be eligible for, but um we definitely could look into that and that will definitely be in here but that's also what the hazard mitigation is plan is for and it's um, required if we participate in the flood insurance program we have to have it updated and they look at that plan when um we apply for these grants and use that to see if we can you know win the money or not good start okay. there's a Maybe we should have a policy on uh, like uh, it doesn't matter. FEMA, no, nah, doesn't matter. I'm just thinking about turnover. Like, how do we make it if we have term turnover within within the organization? Like, uh, if somebody was stepping into the role and an event happens, like as part of our hazard mitigation, you know, what is our what is our FEMA action plan? Like, we have a we have a Toby and we have a road crew that has muscle memory. Um, uh, yeah, and that's also in the uh, local emergency. Management. So, so there's two different documents. Yeah, yeah. One that's updated more yeah. frequently. Um, I forget what the acronyms are. The LHMP. So, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I don't have a question. I have a suggestion for Vicki. Hey, Vicki. Hi. I heard you say that you were not being able to find other towns that have updated their plans since last year's flooding. It makes perfectly good sense. I'm wondering about the towns that have updated their plans since Tropical Storm Irene came through. And I'm thinking specifically of Stockbridge, down in a town between uh, Bethel and Rutland that was just devastated, devastated after Irene, I think from the White River. And I bet they have updated their town plan since Irene came through as well as other towns. So maybe check with them oh, and see how they updated their flood resiliency after I read. I looked, there, I looked at Waterberries, which was yeah. done since I yes, too, yeah. but again, theirs was not, they didn't even have a flood section. It was just kind of interspersed throughout the whole plan. Um, so everyone does it a little differently, yeah. but- um, Northfield. I'll get North, Northfield would be a good one. I know they got actually a buyout from FEMA, so that would be a good one. Um, <laughs> so I have looked at, I'm just saying, letting you know, I've looked at a bunch um, and, I don't know anything about something Vermont. I think Stock, Stock, Stockbridge would be more like Callis with more dirt roads than Waterbury yes. has. Um, I guess the other things that are always here, 
I, for work, I teach classes on how to be floodplain managers for towns. So I offered, I will, I'm offering to do that for Calus if we wanted or for people who are interested. Um, but it's like from a very high level federal look at things. And um, one of the things in here is about the letter of map change process application, which I don't think many people apply for in Calus in general, but they reference like the actual paper applications and having them, which is great. But I know that they're faster and the fees are less expensive if you do it online. So I was willing to um, show you like the bookmarks and everything so you could guide people through that. As well. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that either with myself or with the team. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that's good. I don't have um, anything more. Um, Thanks. I don't think. Me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, this is really important. How about the, the end stages here of mm -hmm. dropping the top. Yeah. So one thing I will say is that a little bit of conversation that you're having tonight is the conversation that we keep having, which <laughs> is the size of the document, right? Um, and that many town plans are not as long as ours. And I we've, all, almost, I don't think I've ever seen one as long as no. <laughs> And so we've had some healthy debate on There's a rich history of that in college. This, <laughs> the, 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 the discussion of what is required by statute, and then what will they look at when they reference the town plan? And then so, like when I say they, like the state, but what is someone going to look at when they then reference back to the town plan? We have had discussions about the same thing, pulling things out and putting them as more anecdotal historical information into the website in some way or into an appendix of some type. We're still not, we still haven't landed on the best way to do that. I mean, our, it's going to be well, probably close to, I'd say 100. It'll be 100. 100 pages. What? Oof. No pictures. And, and that's without no pictures. pictures. So that, I mean, 10 point know, font. we appreciate all the work. Uh, what it needs is, uh, you know, a clear Correct. chunk in the beginning. Here's our policy. Here's our goal. Correct. Here's our, right. you know. So we, we, yes, we, we know one that there won't be tables in there with responsible parties and dates. And that they think that that does not exist. Um, they're just still there because we just, we're just working on the, the wording. Okay. Right. That won't be there. It'll be bullet points of a few things, right? A few strong points of things. Um, we don't feel it's planning commission's duty to make jobs for other <laughs> committees and commit like to say you have to do this by June of 27. Like I that's think that's our technically the select board's job. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. It's not it's not our job to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's bullet points that go toward the goals. Right. Um, so that's one. We're still working on that. But another idea we've had is that there could be the long detailed plan, which is official, and then a short public facing version that then people could, if they wanted to, they could reference the whole thing. But here's a agriculture page, these things. I, I wonder, I mean, if that, so the, the, the requirement for a uh, town plan is a statutory requirement for all of your other land use regulations to be right so um, have the official one that's everything that it needs right. to have and then we're willing to then work to create one that is just but a reader friendly version i think what i what i was going to say is that we don't we may not need to have a long plan so i think the question would be to go back to um because that even if we adopt it as a select board and uh, and it gets voted on by the community, it still has to, or no, actually after we adopt it, it before goes, it gets voted on, it has CBRBC. to get yeah, CVRPC to get approved. So mm -hmm. it may be worth uh, talking to them about the methodology of having a linking type situation. It's just like here, this right. is what we want to do for each one of these segments. We're going to give the this is why it's important. And these are the action items that we're gonna to commit to. And these are the resources that we have available. Is it is it adequate to say that these are the resources that we have available and here's where you can find them? Right. Um, 
without putting that in the town plan to uh, to further yeah. burden the document itself um, and and see if that is something that they would approve before we before we commit to it. But right. I mean, that would be if they said yes, that would be I would think incredibly liberating. Um, I would feel and, about that. and that would that would help really. Like that by linking exactly uh, by like having hyperlinks uh, in there, and then I think like that's right my, now that's my problem with that. Yeah. Is pages go away. Right. Page not found happens all the time. Right. We almost need to have a link, a link within that's our fine. own server that that you, that you took out and stored. We didn't talk about you know. And I wonder if it it could be both. So like if we have the link in there, um, and then also like right now there are a few uh, annotations and footnotes in here that um, have like an asterisk next to it that says, you know, such and such document uh, and and maybe a date that it was adopted. I mean, those, if we call those things what they are, we have physical records of those in the town office. So people can go and find those. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we're maintaining mm -hmm. a, centralized repository we have a server we can likely partition it and have those things be permanent so it's not just a link hey go to this place on a town website and then in right. two years we update the town website and that link's gone right. if we're linking to resources like that as a community from our planning documents that those need to go be linked to a secure server that can be you know pulled pulled from that don't change um and I'm not a doctor, so I, I don't know if uh, the tech consultants would uh, approve of that. But uh, theoretically, it sounds like something that would be prudent. I also wonder if there's a world in which it sort of opens with, say, one page each about each of the sections. So maybe the first 10 or 12 pages is more synopsis that could even be right. printed on its own, right? And then yes. the deeper detail on each section. Yeah, we've talked about... Next. Yeah, we, we, right. we talked about what you do is the short <clears throat> form of it, the synopsis, the detail that you need to have, you know, the overarching vision goals, which if it's an online document could be linked to something. Right. But if it's a printed, it's an appendices. Right. And then it's mm -hmm. it's right. for the more whole detailed read it thing. Too. The whole read it thing. <laughs> I haven't even gone home today. Uh, the whole I forgot a great elementary school yeah. that we can you we can send you to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that would help. You the part that you would that most people would get into and read would right. be the short part. And those people that do want the detail and the the real deep dive could go to exactly. it. But the accessible part to everyday resident could be that simple part. And we've talked about that as well. And, and you could even print versions right. of just the simple parts. You yes. You know, to have available widely. There's right. a piece though that I really don't want you to forget, Please. which is um, that the DRB sometimes looks at the town plan to yes. absorb a regulation that's Correct. fuzzy. Which is where we've gone back and forth with this, how yeah. much is appropriate and yeah. where and how, because a hundred page document without pictures is a long document. This one is 176 pages. But that's got maps and things in it. Ours doesn't yet. I'm fleet. And, and I, I mean, that's if you want me to be completely honest, I would argue that that's too much. That's, that's way too much. That's way too much. This is what you're replacing. I know. No, we're trying to, no, we're we're trying to take it down because it should, it should not be that. I mean, uh, the, the example I give is when we were doing, and Kathy kind of took it over from me, the, the section of town services and, and as we were talking about there, the section talks about water sources and at one point it goes into a page long about the East Calais Water District, the types of tests that it does, how often it does them and how many people are requesting. That's no, but, uh, but that's a lot of information that's often what you put in the vision statement is helpful to the DRB. When it's trying to understand. correct, but I don't so, think I don't think detail like how many no, tests or something. I am not dis necessarily. Disputing it. Yeah. I'm just hoping you don't throw that piece out. When you're no, I think that's the only piece that should be there. <laughs> the visioning and the goals. Yeah, don't worry. There's okay. like there's yeah. so much in the plan that like there is plenty of 
Oh my gosh. There's like a lot that's just like very, a lot of detail that are in other, like I said, official documents, especially when it comes to the flood that we're just repeating and, and it's um it's watering down the actual content that matters. So yeah, and, and there has been recognition from the uh, from CBR PC. Did I get it right that time? I think you did. Yeah. Um, that uh, that these that the the problem with maps and resources. A lot of effort goes into uh, making those things. You know, we, John's done a lot of the work uh, to create our overlays for a period of time. Um, we were recreating our own, but those get either outdated or they're either more accurate or less accurate than than the ones that the state have. And there's a there's a huge push for continuity and flexibility, and and that's where you know I I, I think any any documents that we put in there that are going to be dated um, too quickly or subject to change, um, I, I can't imagine we're going to run into pushback and in like linking to those or referring to those living somewhere else, so that we're we're not trying to. Uh, weigh down the document with uh, with the with the pictures, even though those are the things that draw eyes to things. Yeah. Somebody, Tegan posted a document. I mean, a, a comment um, that is raising your hand. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Dot, and then we'll read Tegan's. Uh, you're on mute, Dot. I just need you to unmute yourself. There you go. Hey, I'm here. Sorry. Um, is that the longer the document, the more you invite ambiguity? And when I was on the DRB, there was a lot of ambiguity within those, uh, within the town plan. So to simplify it, solidify it, make it clear so that whoever reads it will stick with it and understand it, and yeah. it'll be consistent. That's important. Uh, thanks, Doc. Yeah, and T and. Uh, Okay. Well, for the website, it could be yeah. on it. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Can, can you read it? I, I, some of us can't see it. Uh, I think if we put the uh, these on a town plan page, uh, it would be easier to make sure that the documents were not moved, deleted, or accidentally. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's the way that you can, instead of putting it to a web page, it's stored yeah. as PDFs. Right. And then if you go and do redo the web page, you're not losing the page. It's yeah. stored somewhere. Sure. And it's just when you go to need it, it just pulls it right. as yeah. opposed to being right. on a page. Right. So that can be done yeah. as well. Can we just talk about the timeline? Yes. For a minute? So yes. What, what, do you have a date in mind of when this plan needs to be adopted? So it needs to be adopted technically by the end of 2024. Oh. That's very soon. Okay. Uh, that's very soon. Um, I think we could we could make it. The question would be now is how much time could we actually spend cutting it down? Because there's concern that there was so much, and as we redrafted, we left a lot to go through and actually take out could actually take more time. <laughs> because then it's deciding what should stay and what shouldn't stay. And um, that's so, part of it. I yeah. don't know if there's a consensus on the from the planning commission is. that that's the way they want to go. I think at this point we need to just sort of push it together and get it to CBR to see to get their comments and then or I don't actually what's next up for you guys first and then so the, the, the next thing that we need to do is bring a we need to have a final public meeting here on hearing, yeah. A hearing on the plan itself. And once that was done, then we as the planning commission vote to approve that. And then we bring that to the select board, who then in turn would have a hearing, have a hearing and then approve or not approve of that. Okay. And then that goes from there. It just okay. Okay. For okay. So, so it goes then from there to TVRPC for approval. According to the regional planning commission's document, they it's, don't have to approve it. You have to, we have to send it to them. Correct. And so we have to send it to like the the director. Correct. Or Correct. There's, there's you can you can request that they comment on it, and, right. and they have Without to if you ask that. Right. Um, and um, and then you can incorporate their feedback or not. But I think I think in terms of decision making, you're making a recommendation that the select board right. is going to adopt it based on at least two hearings. We want to have right. your level. Our hearing and your hearing. Um, are you saying that that request to them? is prior to the votes here or we need to do that and either then... either group can do it the, the okay. planning commission can request feedback from the planning commission or you can or select board so that's after board. we adopt 
No, I would no, I think it's it, because that they incorporate point? that change um, in the, their recommendation. Yeah. So do you have a hearing scheduled? We do not. Are you thinking November? Is that possible? The last day of November. And this will give us much time if we've we'll got give it. you the month. At the end of budget season. Correct. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> wow. Can we get an extension? We can. We can ask for one. Yeah. Good idea. They basically just approve you, your current plan. From oh. what I understand. Oh. They just mm -hmm. extend your current plan until you have that. Mm -hmm. So we can't do that. We can ask for that. Yes. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, I, we can adopt a plan at any point. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I'm we, sure we can adopt a new plan, plan I mean, you know, a, a modification, right? Like, they would give us an extension for, you know, 90 days or whatever yeah. it would be, it would be my assumption, but. Right, because it looks like there's notifications that have to happen at least 30 days Correct. before the public hearing. Correct. And then so we're actually does this thing, the planning commission and the select board each have to hold a public hearing? Correct. Correct. We hold one. Each have notification yeah. hearing. Yeah. 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 So we didn't have public hearings in January 2025. <laughs> um, perhaps like in February. Yeah, I mean, no, no. If we, as long as the extension happens, I think with the holidays coming up, there's no way people will even be around to attend the meeting. Um, in my opinion, that might be something you want to tell CBRPC with the holidays and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the content is there. It's really a matter of cleaning it up and getting it together and getting yeah. these meetings and scheduling them. Yeah, this is going to be a gross oversimplification, but do you think that um, rather than making the decision to cut things uh, right off, like while asking for an extension just to adopt, uh, like readopt for a period of time while we're continuing to update, right. uh, we can have a uh, draft of the modified one um in its full form without any of these cuts but like just like block highlight like yes. some of the things that were like okay as soon as we stand up a resource for, as a repository Correct. these are the things that we should be moving and then that would make the that i think that would make it a lot more uh, efficient when we uh, like uh, after uh after the end of the year whenever we decide to start holding hearings yes. um we could start forming a dialogue within the community around that kind of structure and approach so be tight. <laughs> yeah. but we so yeah we'll we'll look at the extension the readoption of the current plan for a period of time mm -hmm. so that we can do the things that we need to do and it seems like it'd be worth sitting with this document and say we pick an arbitrary, you know, we will have a goal of adoption by February 20th, mm -hmm. right? And then, okay, if that's going to be this date, let's go back the 15 days and then the, you know, right. sort of do the back down timeline to set okay. timelines throughout to match that. So we can pick a future date and then. Work backward. Work backward to however the deadlines for meeting. each each warning for each meeting here. Does the select board want to set that date? Because you can. Well, do we want CBPRCP? CBRPC. I know I'm just reading it and it's wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiled. <laughs> you know what? That's what they get. We want the regional planning commission's input before we act. I would think that would, might be a plus, right? And because that adds more time. It would add that. That would be my only thing. It would add more time to the process, but it might be valuable feedback. Like tell them we want an extension so we can hear their input. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, we're considering major, major, major structural changes to our plan that make the document more accessible, et cetera, et cetera. Like we need more time. Um, I, you know, I would, I would challenge uh, the planning commission um, to 
maybe try to have a, a draft of like the fully edited text version without the photos We're already by like by the end of the by the end of the year with that with those like blocks like these are the things that we're thinking about like pulling out as as okay. links to other yeah. other segments of the website and you know maybe maybe that's the thing that goes to the cbrpc say like listen these are this is a, a big shift in how we're trying to present this information so this is stuff we might not yeah. want in there is this what are you doing? what are your thoughts yeah and and yeah. so you know that that timeline is then the end of the year i think that would put us in good position to potentially uh, think about an expedited timeline for holding hearings, et cetera, et cetera. If we try to do that in the first quarter, uh, or, you know, end of the first quarter and then, uh, after the holiday, but in the meantime, we should absolutely say that this is our rationale for, um, trying to get an extension, uh, or yeah. An extension. And from what I understand, we are not in a few company there to ask for extensions. And that that extension including, doesn't require I, and from what I understand, document. including the CBRPC themselves. I think they had to extend their plan because <laughs> they couldn't get it. Uh, they sure did. Yeah, I, so I do remember seeing. I that. think we're yeah. I think it's not it's not uncommon that once you get into it, you're chipping away and it's taking longer than it needs to. So the first quarter of twenty twenty five. Um. The only thing I would say is we need to time that. You don't want it necessarily around town meeting, like where it feels like it's supposed to be part of town meeting. Like, yeah, yeah. Right? Like I, I absolutely agree. Because it's not something that it has to be approved to town meeting, but if it's around that time, it's gonna feel like, well, is this we're voting on this today too? So we have to yeah. we have to time that, whether it's before or after, we've got to time that. May first. I would also think about May first. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, do it earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking we need to get it done, but I don't know how long. Knowing, knowing yeah, like what the scope of work is for the DRB and what they have to consider, you know, I think it's important to try to get it buttoned up before the construction season uh, starts because the DRB is going to start looking at certain applications and conditional use applications, um, you know, in May-ish. But anyway. Um, we'll, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Like yeah, I, I'm trying. I'm we'll work on it. Uh, we have, a, meet, we have a, a special meeting tomorrow, so okay. we'll talk about all this. My goal then will be to come out of this meeting tomorrow with a plan. Uh, good. Dates that, that, that here's what we're going to do. Great. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have the next up is the uh, repositioning of the town hall generator. Um, and there is a proposal that uh, was uh, sent in uh, with a drawing um, provided from the design review uh, uh, board and uh, and the DRB DAB DAB yeah I'm uh, sorry design advisory board um, uh, and some input from the emergency uh, management uh, committee and. Uh, has everybody had a chance to review those? Um, so we're looking at a proposed move that uh, involves moving the generator um, instead of in front of uh, the where the propane tanks are currently located. Uh, it would be back and to the left uh, uh, right now. That would also be a, a drop down in, uh, in elevation slightly, but as represented on the map, that is still out of the floodplain, so it's close. Um, and that's where we're at. So thank you, John, for making that uh, map. And uh, and thanks to the Design Advisory Board for staying on top of this and coming up with a proposal. Um, and I, the emergency management, uh, Jake, are you here to kind of speak to that? Uh, particular item or Nick's on, or Nick is on Zoom. Yeah, Nick uh, wrote the letter, but we all approved it as a committee. Person. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Nick, do you want to summarize those uh, those inputs for the community? Uh, yes, members. It's pretty pretty simple, really. Uh, it was concern based on a concern about uh, the fact that the generator would be moving um, a little closer to the flood hazard zone, a little closer to the stream, 
in uh, and uh, in a location which is vulnerable because it being at the confluence of two streams, Duger Brook and Pekin Brook. And um, most people uh, hold the opinion that with climate change advancing, the vulnerability of the, the end, the lower end of Kent Hill Road will be increasing and probably not holding steady. And so um, that, that's what it comes down to. We, the committee totally recognized the historical and aesthetic values are important uh, to the placement of the generator. Uh, and our recommendation does not address us because it's not part of our um, mandate or expertise. Mm -hmm. Jay, Jay, feel free to jump in on that. Okay, I might, didn't make I have a question. Is there the potential for just raising it higher? I don't know, by building cement up or putting legs under or something? Yeah. You still, that's what FEMA recommends for, they have, a, a, I know, I believe me, I do this. Like, okay. it's, um, Screw piles. No, I know they um you don't want to use because the water can't go through freely the whole thing and they get mad. But um oh. if you do stilts, um it's raising the like facilities that power our building and it's like a actually like a federal requirement for certain things. Um stilts. I think John could elaborate, but the, the purpose of the DAB proposal is to get it out of view as much as possible. And so raising it up would defeat that purpose. Is that is that accurate, John? It is. That's too bad. I, I don't know that that's, in, well, I, well, so here, I'm going to test this rationale. Um, right now, we have a uh, flood hazard overlay that puts it outside of the hazard zone. And if we were to uh, put it there uh, in the interim and the flood hazard zone changes uh, after mm -hmm. we've made that change, it would likely be grandfathered as a covered item um, if we had to replace it and it was damaged by a flood in the future, um, right? No, no. If we will willfully put it next to the river, yeah. uh, even though it's yeah. outside. Well, there are, they are working on new maps. That's gonna be a very long time until they, they get the new flood maps. But um, I, I mean, so you're saying like, because it's not like we, you're saying we keep it out, but then it's not, in that it's grandfathered outside, or are you seeing the opposite for I got a little bit there with that. The proposal is to put it right at almost at the edge of the floodplain, but it's not in the floodplain. It's what it's happens 16 feet from the boundary of the floodplain. Yeah. Currently it's 30 feet from that boundary. You know what you could do? You could um like get a surveyor or someone to say it's at this elevation and then the floodplain you know, the flood elevation is at this elevation. So it would theoretically be out because when it's that close, FEMA doesn't really belt it on the edge of caution. Right. And so then by having the actual elevation, you really can't argue with that. It's like a letter of mapping before the generator. Okay. I think from the emergency management perspective, uh, we're also not just approaching it from what if the generator gets damaged uh, during a flood, uh, it's uh, the, Prudence of putting it in closer to harm's way when it is a real uh, a utility for being able to provide power and heat for this building, which is an emergency which management is an asset. Emergency shelter. Yeah, but I, I guess I would say that if we are seeing a flood event that then puts into jeopardy that this would not be an adequate emergency shelter. Anyway, so it seems like it's almost a moot point. I don't think that they're at that elevation anywhere we would put it around a building. It would be likely a uh, a lost asset or at risk. So Did you elevate it on the building, like it's, uh, it's too big to put yeah. it on top of the building. What we're saying though, it's going to be this place is going to be an island anyway. You get that much water, who's going to be coming down here? Well, it's not, we're not talking about for that specific event. We're just talking about where we would, you know, the risk of losing that that uh, strategic asset when for for the next emergency event. That, that it's, uh, that's our opinion is to, to not put it closer to harm's way. Well, the next one you buy is going to be a lot better and a lot cheaper. And don't worry. We haven't heard from the uh, historic preservation aspect of this. Um, well, except that there are several 
historic preservation committee members who are on the design advisory board. So we kind of have. And if we have this evening. Uh, not not this evening. Um, Bill, Bill, I think, or John, would you like to speak to John? Are you on the design advisory? Okay, right. Thanks. Um, would either of you like to speak to that? The proposal. Is there a screen well, involved in the proposal? Yes. And looking yes. at where we're putting it, where we're, where we're proposing allows plantings. Well, we couldn't put any plantings yeah. now. They'd, they'd be in the, the drive down to the. It's back too road. close to the building as it is. If now, if you try to plow through there, you had to. You might hit the generator. It's really close to the building. Yeah, that's a major concern. It sounds the proposal sounds good to me. Uh, the distance between the current location, the generator, and the corner of the porch is approximately 18 feet. And there are vehicles driving back there um, on a regular basis currently. I, I hear that, uh, Nick, but uh, it, it's not a ton of space, and that's the only uh, auxiliary parking space that we've got on, on the building. Um, I guess the, the question is if, if the purpose is to be able to plant some vegetation as a screen, a visual screen from the, the parking lot, then even if it is pushed back, it could also go up as long as that vegetation that's planted where the current generator is, is obstructing the view of the, the generator for historic preservation visual aesthetic. That, I mean, that's certainly my sense, Jake, is that like it, the, the big gain here is I, I think that we've uh, gotten some pretty specific feedback in a proposal from the design advisory uh, committee that is plantings. And, you know, I think that, uh, the other advantage here is that it's close proximity to where it currently is. So the modification of power, et cetera, et cetera, is, is going to be uh, more, more affordable. And, and frankly, it sounds like we're going to have to put it on uh, screw pairs uh, or helical piles, um, which are going to go in faster and probably cheaper than concrete pads. Um, uh, so, you know, if we can make the accommodation for vegetation that, that we can find a form of vegetation that'll accommodate the increased elevation um, to, to help kind of mitigate, mitigate the risks of placement. We're anticipating using the same precast pad that's on now. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no connection to the ground. It's on a gravel base. Could the, the plantings be moved up sort of more along the would, driveway? It would, it would be up. And then the generator, instead of sort of that part, would be down over the hill. Yes. Could it be moved up closer to the planting, sort of on line with the concrete blocks? Which is a little bit higher elevation. Would that? I mean, I think we could get those uh, those concrete blocks right there. Are, uh, the two uh, three by fours um, waste blocks. So yeah. I I don't see why we wouldn't be able to infill back there to elevate the ground and then put the pad put the pad on top of whatever the fill structural fill is. Even if we weren't going to use the screw piles. But I think either way, we probably need to adopt whatever the securing strategy or mounting strategy is going to be acceptable to FEMA. So this one here, dated October 27, mm -hmm. shows roughly five feet between the proposed location of the, the location of the generator and the uh, edge of the drive. So we could put some plants in there, but yeah, but I don't know how much how much do you want to move the generator. You're talking about moving the generator a little more this way, away from the floodplain. We're talking about twelve inches. <laughs> no, I, I'm talking about it. I'm I'm saying that we if you move it to where it's up. been where it's been uh, identified as a good location to accommodate the screening there, and then elevating it uh, either with fill and then reusing the precast or putting in for screw piles and then putting it on top of the so screw piles. So it's the same elevation it is now? Uh, correct. Okay. We'd have to use some like screw piles. Some yeah. But then you just say it would be extra helpful if there's water to flow in the Yeah, right. I'd say the fill would, if FEMA was ever to do like an audit, they would 
that would be very bad. Yeah. But um, <laughs> like that makes them freak out. But um, yeah, I'd say trying to get on like a sort of like a beach house is the best way to do it. But it, I don't actually know where this is. I didn't. Is it the offices over there? It's no, right, 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 right. Right. Yeah, that's oh, that's okay. good. It might be a little difficult to service. So if it's yeah. on screw piles, to get up. Well, yeah, we're just kind of at the bottom of the generator is going to be roughly five feet above grade. Yeah, if you raise it, but you're talking about raising the generator up so that it's at the current level it is right now, but putting it I'm just going to put it about post, three three feet in the air. It's going to be on a five foot metal base. It's currently sitting on a four foot um, angle iron base on top, which is on top of the cast concrete pad. Which it's is more big, it's more like no, it's 30 30. inches. Like, yeah, 30 inches, which is has more to do with access for snow, I would imagine, uh, than anything else, right? That's generally why they go up there. So, uh, that would essentially be doing the same thing. Just another comment I wanted to throw in while we're talking about the placement and so forth that that one propane tank does serve as both the supply for the heat for this building and for that generator. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the uh, uh, possibility that, you know, if we want to actually be more resilient to actually having more propane capacity, that is something that might want to be considered as, you know, part of the project to add a uh, another propane tank down there. But it's just something that I wanted to Put out while we're talking about reconfiguring everything because I don't, uh, we should do some calculations, I think, on how much uh, heating and, you know, full load or even partial load uh, generator running capability that we have, you know, for that, that propane tank to consider, you know, is it, is it something that we do want to expand? But just having the flexibility, I think, in the future is something that would be wise to at least. Think about that one. Uh, thanks, Jake. I, so I'd like to uh, kind of table the rest of this dialogue. I think this is a good presentation of what the option is that would be agreeable for uh, the design advisory board. Um, we'd still need to come up with a, a, a budget for doing it and figure out procurement and timelines, et cetera. So I think there's still more dialogue to be had. Um, um, but we've got the feedback that I think we need for now um, to think about what next steps would be um, and we'll schedule a time to do it. I mean, we're going to be talking about budgets uh, for the next couple of weeks. So um, I don't have a specific timeline for it, uh, but it's been, but it's been raised and noted. Is that fair for everyone for now? Um, and I'd like to move on to uh, the fiscal year uh, 2026 budgets. Uh, and thanks, uh, John and uh, Jake and Nick uh, for uh, taking taking all those things into consideration. Uh, so first up, uh, we have uh, the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And apologies for <laughs> for the uh, marathon that we're going through. Um, Hi, I'm Dan Proberg. I'm the executive director of the Kellogg Covered Library, and sorry, we're telling you to come up here. So <laughs> um, I have a few copies of our most recent um, annual report. Um, here, circulate. I don't have enough right now. Okay, this one. Thank but you. But circulate them, and if anyone wants to hang on to them. Uh, we'll thank you. Try and keep our comments brief since I know you've been here a while already. Um, I'm joined by Jeff Dean, who's our Vice President on our board and our uh, representative from Callis on our board. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're requesting um, $34,881 for the fiscal year 26. Um, we, uh, you know, try and project as accurately as we can our budget long in advance of uh, it going into effect. We're on a July 1 calendar uh, fiscal year as you are. Um, that uh, represents about a, a $1,600 and $1,661 or 5% increase over our request from last year. And just a quick correction, that's a $1 per uh, increase, not $2, as is indicated on here. Um, we're the public nonprofit library serving six towns in Central Vermont. 
Berlin, Calais, East Montpelier, Middlesex, Montpelier, and Worcester. Um, we have more than a hundred and more than a, easily more than a hundred thousand visitors to our building every year. Uh, we're the second busiest library in Vermont by uh, circulation and by visitors, um, and our overall budget is uh, around one point one million dollars. Um, in addition to obviously books and all the materials we have in the library, we make um, uh, digital resources available as well, so ebooks and streaming videos, magazines, all of that, um, and programming and outreach. We bring books to uh, the Adamant, Adamant Co op and to Make the Corner Store. Uh, we're doing a program at the Cal Elementary School tomorrow, actually, a preschool story time and a craft, and everyone who attends will be able to bring a book home with them for free. Um, so we really make an effort to come out um, and serve all the town um, as much as we can. Um, our increase is primarily related to health insurance costs, which I'm sure you're all dealing with as well. Um, so, you know, we have Blue Cross 23% increase for next year. So um, we're doing our best to manage that um, by, you know, being really trim on the administrative side. And um, But it's, yeah, benefit costs are uh, really where that increase comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, well, talk about how you use the library. Then. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I've been on the library board for almost two years now, um, other than Maple Corner, with my uh, wife and two children. Uh, my boys uh, make use of the library uh, sometimes on the weekends, sometimes after school. I grew up in Middlesex going to the library after school. Uh, I went to U32, and my mom would pick me up there, so it's really been nice to see, you know, not only my kids, but lots of other kids making use of this resource as a place to go after school. Uh, and I sometimes go into town myself to work there. In fact, this week on Thursday, I'll be working at the library. I see other people making use of the library that way, um, using the internet, um, computer resources, and what have you. Um, and I know the library is planning on um, uh, having some uh, furnished meeting rooms to, to increase the use of so that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's been a resource for me in my life since I was a kid uh, and, you know, very pleased to be using it now with my children as well. I'll just say just in the past week, in the coming week, we, on Saturday, we hosted Jack Queen story time. We had about 80 people in attendance. We had a haunted house in the evening. We had 200 people in attendance for that. These are all free programs we do. We're having uh, the event tomorrow at the elementary school. We're doing a sign language story time on Thursday. We're doing a Diwali celebration. Um, we really try and serve um, as broad a range of the community as we can with uh, free programs. So, um, community resource. I Barbara left two boxes of COVID tests next to the door for me to bring to the library. Um, on top of the more than 10,000 that we've distributed in the last three months at the library. Um, so, really try and be a resource center in every way. Thank you, Paul. Happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions? Is it the second busiest library in the state? Correct. Busier than Rutland, Burlington. Yeah. Burlington. 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 And we're second. Wow. Uh, yeah, it looks like Chris. Didn't know what uh, library expenses were last year. Um, both operate, you know, total costs of what they took in in regards to what they actually spent. Um, I think I read somewhere that uh, they took in, you took in significantly more than you spent. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so just wondering, you know, where things are budget wise last year. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, our fiscal year that ended June 30th of 2020, <laughs> um, we did take in more than we expended, but it's related to the flood construction costs and the timing. So the revenue came in last year, but the expenses will be this year. We have that $2 million in flood expenses um, at the library, um, both sort of direct expenses and then the cost of making the building more resilient, which is required by the monthly year uh, building code. So moving all those mechanical systems out of the basement in a historic building is a complicated and expensive endeavor. So um, that's mostly a timing issue. So the I think it was like an extra 300,000, which is essentially what you took in from the 
surrounding communities. Is that correct? That's what the budget surplus was? Uh, I don't have that number specifically in my head, but something to that order, it was significant, yeah. So you you asked communities for the money and then you ended up with all this extra money. So um, that it's not it's not profit, so to speak. It's money that's gonna be spent this year. It's just a timing issue of when the money came in as opposed to when it's spent. And it's uh, the accounting complicated by the fact that we have to capitalize expenses, so the revenue and we so it's it's a more complicated answer than that. Um, but the it's not that we took in extra money for our operations. It was extraordinary circumstances related to the flood damage. No, yeah, well, I mean, all the communities have had to deal with flooding. Um, so, I mean, I guess, you know, I just have a hard time looking at those numbers. And yeah, there's timing involved in all that. And all the communities have had to deal with flooding. Then here you are asking for more money again, an increase. And I guess I just have a hard time with that. Chris, I, I I appreciate your concern in registering your concern. Um, I I want to kind of stop that short. I think of without having a look at what the what the impacts are. I don't think we know what the costs are for the flooding expenses. I, I mean, there's a there could be a loss on the other side of that um, if they're seeing expenses generated in uh, in expenses generated or coming due in, in a fiscal year that's different in, uh, than the year that they received their uh, reimbursements from FEMA, I imagine was most of the grant money was coming from. I mean, we're not in a dissimilar position as a town. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I'm just, this is how it appears. I mean, you, like my neighbor, Jim, expressed his the same concern because this is what's on paper. The library took in more money than they spent, and that's just you know the optics of the situation. And and I, and I also hear, I also hear that you know, FEMA doesn't pay quickly. There are all these expenses. I I get that. I'm just registering my concern as um, a resident of Callis in regards to what I see. Well, I appreciate that perspective. Are there any uh, other uh, comments or questions for the uh, for the library folks? Yes, Craig. Uh, I'm the previous Calis representative to the library, served for nine years, and I think what Dan said is they're asking for a sixteen hundred dollar increase over last year. Is that right? Sixteen hundred dollars and sixty one. Yeah. Right. And so if you take that sixteen hundred dollars and divide it by the approximately sixteen hundred residents of the town, that's one dollar a piece. And for my money, that, that that's money well spent. Well, okay. thank, thank you, Craig. Another way of looking at it was I think your last is five percent more than it was last year. We're going to have to work very hard in Calus to get our budget down to five percent. Yeah, and medical insurance is a big drag. Yeah, medical insurance is huge. I mean, that is, uh, I would say, as a as a community member, if I'm going to be outraged about something, it's going to be it's going to be uh, the twenty six and twenty three percent increases that we're seeing in insurance premiums that is making it untenable for um, for these. Uh, organizations and municipalities that that run on you know razor razor thin budgets and are uh, held accountable you know are accountable to uh, uh, to the cost of living um, in their communities. Um, so I commend you guys um, for working with what you got and frankly for being able to get reimbursement from FEMA. I mean we we as a <laughs> it was a uh, last year was mostly the flood insurance. We had a oh yeah, okay. Policy. Uh, have you, okay. so are you anticipating an increase in flood, uh, flood insurance premium as well? Have uh, you already seen that? Increase, but we have private insurance before and the NFIP, they kicked us off. And the NFIP plan is a similar cost. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Can the update on the timing of the elevator repair? Um, been a very frustrating process. Yeah. Um, our contractors uh, still waiting on parts. We so we signed a contract with the elevator company in October of last year, um, which was just because we had to make a plan for where we were moving the machine and all that. Mm -hmm. um, still waiting on parts. Um, still trying to. Get them to come. I, it's just everyone in Montpelier is dealing with the same yeah. issue, unfortunately. And there's only so many technicians and parts to go around. There's a global supply chain issue with elevator parts. So the timing was uh, not great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but we're, we're working really hard to try and get everything back in order. All right. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. And, yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I appreciate you making that. Drive out here <laughs> and staying so late. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Um, next up, we have emergency committee. Jake. Yeah. So our fiscal year uh, 2025 budget. Oh, first off, I just wanted to mention that. I sent the link to Barbara, and there's two pages to that spreadsheet. One of them said old, and the other one is the new. So I think by default, when you opened it, it might have gone to the old one, which is um, separated out by 2026 and So I just want to make sure that you're looking at the right page on that. Because the reason why we have the old page is, is actually that is has links to what we're going to be spending our 2025 uh, budget on. Um, so for 2026, our budget request is uh, $492.23. Uh, that is uh, allocated to the um, actually getting a first aid kit and a trauma kit and some Narcan for the town hall because there is no first aid kit in this building. Oh. Uh, it's getting for some headsets for the ham radio base stations to actually, if there's an event of emergency, being able to actually uh, muffle out the ambient noise and actually being able to hear the uh, uh, radio operators better. A uh, carbon monoxide detector that is going to be for the town hall or if the can be, is it the battery powered one that just plugs in because that was a concern of the fire marshal of running the generator and having a shelter that we don't have the carbon monoxide detector on site. And so that's just a, a small one. Uh, a smaller cable to make it a little bit more accessible to be able to use the, the radio. So it's an extension of the, the cable that is going to be mounted in the wall and, and grounded uh, back there. So that way you don't have to operate the radio right in those back cabinets. And then also um, three hand crank weather radio flashlight charger units, one for that will live at each shelter. So that way you can at least listen to the, if there's no other communication, you can listen to the emergency weather radio if you are at any of the shelter locations. We also had a few items on our, our wish list that I don't know if you want me to necessarily dive into those if you have any questions on this. That, that wasn't actually part of our budget, but that was just ideas that we had that would be nice to have for the town and as strategic emergency management assets. Uh, I, I mean, I think, that, I think it's going to be really, really hard to be uh, adding adding wish list items on there, but I, I do think it's important to, to note them so we don't lose track of them. And as we find grant opportunities, um, uh, maybe those are the things that we can uh, apply. That was funding to, yeah. on there was just to keep them in mind. If, yeah, yeah. If opportunities come around where for funding or if it is. Uh, you keep it in mind for the, the select board in, in case that one of them is deemed to be of uh, uh, high enough importance to actually include it in the budget. Mm. Are there other specific questions uh, about the budget? Yeah. I mean, a, a couple of these things, you know, the stuff for the town hall, it seems like mm -hmm. whether we put it in their budget or the town hall budget, it's stuff we should have here, the first aid kit, the carbon monoxide detector. I mean, it all seems like everything on the list seems 
worthwhile and yeah. yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. Um, thank you. Nick, do you have any any other uh items that address or comment? No, I think Jake covered it pretty well. Thank you. No, all right. Um so I was asked to restore reserve fund allocations to the 23 levels. So for emergency measures reserve fund, I just kept it at the current years, which was the first year. I, we just created that fund as a town and put a thousand dollars in here mm. this year. So I, I just assumed we were going to do that again. Hopefully that meets the approval of the committee. That was our plan was upon recommendation of Vermont Emergency Management was to, um, if the town could allocate $1,000 to that fund for five years and then and then hold it there, that that would be a, a good base amount to have in that reserve fund. Um, yeah, depending on the constraints of the budget year by year. And those reserve funds are largely used uh, for uh just kind of emergency purchases in the event of but not generally for like infrastructure type purchases and that sort of thing right so it's important to keep that kind of baseline to be, yeah to be able to reimburse for if we quickly need food yeah. for the shelter yeah. And, yeah. During, and we need to put people up here or something yeah. just, to be, just to be clear better. and just to be clear it's, it's not a line item this is a um, money that doesn't go away unless it's right spent. unless it's spent correct yeah thank you nick All right. Well, uh, thanks, Jay. Great. I think Thank we'll you. add that to the add that to the spreadsheet, and then um, it'll it'll be in there. We'll try to try to keep everything as close <laughs> as possible, you know, to to the request. At this point, we're we're just trying to kind of field uh, specific requests, and um, and then it'll be put into our uh, into our spreadsheet, basically. And we may need to nitpick quite a bit, but you know, thank you for the. The background context. Do you have any questions? Yeah, appreciate it. Um, sorry, got distracted. Uh, the next group is the Planning Commission. Is that right? Yes, Planning Commission. Um, gone. I no money for no comment. <laughs> I I did not know this is how we were talking. About. Um, so, Martin wrote to us and said they didn't need any money. I, I, I think, don't think I think they wrote and said same as last year. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Which was just to remind people, it um, was uh, two hundred dollars for education and training, seven hundred fifty for general planning commission expenses, planning reserve fund. <laughs> Okay. Go into the spreadsheet. Yeah. I'll go into the spreadsheet. Uh, animal control. Do we have? Buffy's not here. Buffy. She also wrote a note. Largely wants to keep things the same. She wanted to. She has to bump the stipend up to an even twelve hundred, so it's a hundred dollars per month. And uh, and then have to refer back to the amendment. We got five hundred for. Dog expenses and humane society, and two hundred dollars for animal control expenses. I know she wanted to buy a harness or a piece of equipment that would help her with dogs. That's dog equipment. Nineteen hundred total, which is less than the twenty-seven hundred yes. yeah. from last year. Yeah. Or oh. year. Okay. That, that sounds fair to me. I can't, can't yeah. argue with that. Um. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and thank you, Buffy. Uh, swim committee, Daniel? Swim committee, yeah. Um, I actually have sort of three requests. So, request for um, an increase appropriation to $4,000 this year. And then, uh, given that we're replacing the dock this year, we also see authorization from the select board to use earnings from our endowment fund. And we also see authorization to um, borrow money on, uh, on a one-time basis from our endowment fund to do that. 
the dog. Dog. The dog. So how much is the endowment fund? How much is so the endowment fund is five thousand dollars, and it's restricted in use, as far as I can tell, to nothing. <laughs> Simply, we're not allowed to use it. We can let use the earnings. And the earnings are recommended that we use those on capital projects. You never use, never use them. Um, the docs forty six eighty six, the quote that Mark Whitman got for us. Um, so we'd like to um, take the twenty five hundred dollars that was appropriated to the doc last year as being kind of correct. This year, this year, four by twenty five. Excuse me, uh, and then add to that. Our previous earnings from our endowment fund, which is about fourteen hundred and thirty dollars, uh -huh. and then borrow another like seven hundred and fifty from the endowment itself with principal. Uh, but you said you weren't allowed to do that. Well, it's a it's a loan, and we, we intend to repay it with uh, part of our uh, part of our budget in, in FY twenty six. Wow. So it's not with interest. It's not from interest. <laughs> Yeah, so in my budget, I have part part of the earnings is three days as well, two hundred and thirty dollars. Okay. Um. Yeah. It, this is a, this is a, an increased request though, over and above our regular operating expenses. Um, we benefited from an annual appropriation for our operating expenses, and twice in the last four years, we didn't run the program, so. It hadn't caught, caught up with us until this year. Um, but I think when I joined the swim committee in 2019, we got guidance from the town uh, that we really shouldn't have 15 year old swim assistants. And then further guidance was that we shouldn't have, um, we needed both water safety instructor uh, certification and lifeguard certification. We made the decision on our own to hire two people for the purpose of redundancy. We really thought we needed two people to run the program on any given day anyway, just to have more eyes on kids. Mm -hmm. um, but that brings our costs, our labor costs for a summer to somewhere between, um, well, let's say like 3500 and $4,000, which we do not cover. The most fees, I think, We've collected in my time has been somewhere around nineteen hundred dollars. So um, this is just sort of um, the, the, the reset a little bit. I don't expect future budget requests to be this high. I expect them to be more than twenty five hundred dollars. Well, we we only allocated half of what you requested last year for the dog. And at the time we told you we would try to allocate the rest this year. So do you remember do you guys all remember? Mm -hmm. That's the picture. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, you're from FY yeah. Yeah. The if you have a budget that I submitted a couple of days in front of you go in front of you, that's no longer fully accurate because there was a conversation with your team. Kind of mentioned it this morning, which changed my math a little bit, but um, yeah, I'm happy to resubmit the, the new budget. It seems like the funding strategy is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Is there a, a process for? how the swim committee considers its like its fees and whether or not to raise them. I mean the accessibility seems to be a, a huge driver, but yeah we're raising them. We had we had planned already before today's math on raising them uh ten dollars to, to thirty. They're currently twenty, which I think is a screaming good deal. Sure. Um, sure. I think we're looking more at forty dollars as the fee, uh, but we might do it over two years. This this Push in the blow because we're also actively recruiting more families. We, you know, from 2020 to 2024, you can imagine there have been some hiccups in mm -hmm. terms of uh, participation, us not running the program two years, not the least of which. Um, mm -hmm. So we're we're trying to bring more families into the program at the moment, and so we don't want to raise raise these too high and 
and turn people off for that reason. But we estimate, I, I think on average, we, we tend to serve somewhere around 60 swimmers, um, 50, to, 50 to 60, and we're, we're aiming to go a little higher this year. Okay. Time will tell. Uh, yes, Kai. One quick question. Um, a parent alum of the program, uh, we're not debating the value of it. Um, is there a sliding fee scale for families that can't afford even $20? How does that work? If you're raising it to 30 and to 40, that might scare some off. Yeah, that's a concern. There's not a sliding scale. In the past, uh, Calus residents residents were 20 we could consider uh, a lower resident we could consider a south sliding scale based on ability to pay we could also consider a two you know a, two, a, a bigger a bigger difference between in town and out of town uh fees because a, a significant number of swimmers do come from out of town we're besides Montpelier rec center we're the only other sort of summer swim option in the area otherwise I have to go so, so I wonder if there's a if there's a deficit uh, a bit in the budget whether or not uh, th there's like an informal sliding scale you know, where you, the community members who uh, have kids who are enrolling you know could pay uh, extra it's somewhat we've had this conversation about making donations to certain groups but if you're willingly paying more for a service that goes directly into your budget as opposed to donating and saying like this extra dollar goes to the swim committee, which can get hard and problematic for the town sometimes to manage how that gets gets funneled, right? It's just a challenging accounting measure. But if uh, if there was an opportunity to overpay for um, for uh, enrollment, you might find community members willing to do that for sure for, yeah, yeah. for their, no, for their kids. I'll, I'll take that back to the committee. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we've also not been aggressive with our, um, our pursuit of fees when we have no shows. Mm. Um, I think asking people to pay up front could, could, you know, significantly lose revenues. We have a lot of sort of no shows. Um, and we've tightened up our our season to four one week sessions instead of six one week sessions mm -hmm. to to reduce personnel costs and sort of increase the per class attendance. But uh, I think we could be a little bit a little bit uh, snappier with our debt collection. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate it. So is it more comfortable with what the two no, two authorizations of the endowment oh. earnings and the endowment fund itself and the and the loan or or are we just the loan itself from the endowment from the endowment from the earnings sure. yes for the short term yeah, yeah very short term yeah yeah right yeah the, the doc uh, Mark's Mark's advice was that the doc really ought to be I think ordered by May first. Okay. In order to have it in the in the water by Memorial Day, which obviously this is the year, not next year. Right. So that's where, really what we're talking about. The gap in time. Mm -hmm. oh, you're gonna have a whole bunch of riprap together. Why don't we just mm -hmm. <laughs> we could make a jetty? Gary, he wants you to know that this will be a replacement of the dock and the raft was recently. So that's it for capital needs for the right. swim area for a good long time. Good yeah. Long. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so do we need, uh, make a motion to uh, uh, authorize think, that? Oh. oh, yeah, that would be good. Oh, yeah, we yeah. want that in the minutes. Okay. Um, and so we drop. Uh, entertain a motion to authorize uh, the use of the uh, earnings, uh, current accrued earnings uh, in the endowment fund uh, to the total of $1,400. Is that correct? Fourteen hundred and thirty dollars, um, and uh, with the approval to uh, borrow against future earnings for the total of seven hundred dollars, seven hundred and sixty dollars, um, for the per uh, for the purpose of making up the difference in funds for purchasing a new dock. So moved. 
Second. Can I offer a friendly amendment? Yes. yes. Take off the, the amount of the earnings because because it's an investment fund that can grow by that. Right. And then say up to the borrowing amount because we may be able to borrow less than that. Right. And that, that provides flexibility. I would, well, you've got to adopt it. Yes. Yeah. I would accept that. Great. You get it, Rose. Just state the motion, please. Uh -huh. uh, so Waiting all... way, need a motion to authorize the use of earnings above the five thousand dollar level in the Vanguard Swim Fund okay. investment fund, and further to to borrow from the fund up to eight hundred dollars. Um, for the balance of the purchase of the new dock to be repaid in this little place. There's About the 5000 yeah. and, 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 and to the car in one. And to the borrow of $300 of the property. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Daniel. Daniel. Happy docking. And future plans, uh, future work plans for FY26 budget needs, or are we just going to review the worksheet? Oh. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we need to delve into the worksheet other than to know that it's starting to take shape. Yeah, um, you can ignore the totals right now because I haven't updated certain parts of the budget. But you can see that somewhere around two thirds of it is there's a draft number in there, and it makes um, several updates to the highway department budget after our last conversation. I removed the loose with the grant expense, just seeing the writing on the wall that we're gonna. We can defer that one, so we I think we want it. to yeah. reduce the high the gravel expense. We're still we're still up sixteen percent over the current year, so there's more work to do there. Uh, that's really all I have to say about that. I think after I make this round of updates, and um, I think we're going to be ready to start delving in. Well, I guess after the meeting on the eleventh, you're going to hear from conservation, energy, and trails. And that's pretty much all the internal groups. We've got the sheriff on the 25th and then the two fire departments on the, on the summer night. There's one thing we didn't put on the agenda, but we talked about when we did our agenda planning is we may need a dedicated extra meeting in December, yeah. but potentially the in between the two December meetings, you get the ninth, Right, sixteenth might be a good meeting to just clear the decks and only talk about budget, and then we have the twenty third. It was a crazy time to have a meeting. Good to meet the twenty third. I no, well, by Zoom. They, oh my gosh, no, I'm going to be in the mountains. Won't be able to Zoom. So maybe we want to just adjust the schedule over here. About the thirty one. I mean, we could do the 16th and the 30th. Oh, well. uh, the 30th. Not too excited about the 30th. No. <laughs> no. Well, you can do it without me. The 23rd could be a brief meeting. I, I think it's. I don't know. <laughs> Especially if we meet the 16th. Thank you. Um. Right. But, but being pretty, um, uh, uh, what is it, conservative about what we put on the agenda, primarily budget and hopefully very little else. On the 23rd. Is what I mean. No, on the 16th. We have a special The 16th will be a budget meeting. Well, you're also going to be working on the warning. There's a message from takeout. Twenty third is her birthday. Oh. So we're definitely doing it. Or are you saying we definitely should? It's not clear, Keegan. Do you want to party with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about December 2nd? You guys are really nice in 16. Could we bump it earlier? 
We could. We won't have the fire department, and, um, uh -huh. but we'll have a lot to, to work with. Either. You won't be here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thanks, me. Well, you certainly shouldn't try to schedule right now. No. Okay. No. And take that. Uh, yeah. That sounds good to me. Um, Curtis Von Dam Rehabilitation Project. Uh, update on uh, construction uh, progress and sort of the budget. Because today they poured the base of the spillway. On Wednesday, they will pour the walls of the spillway, the walkway out to operate the low water valve and some concrete steps yeah. that we added to the ice end for their access to the pond. So they'll pour those three things Wednesday, which will be the final concrete pour of the project. Um, the good news, I don't have the source of uses up here, but we're all said and done about 42, thousand um above the 1.2 million that was our goal budget um but we think we've saved 30 to 35 thousand um over the last week and a half in um reduced concrete for a variety of reasons um the concrete came in probably at least 30 probably quite a bit more shy of the budget so we should come in you know within 10 or 15 thousand um of the budget and i don't see any other that's expected bridges yeah. um it's yeah so it's all good news on that front we need to adopt tonight an acceptance of the uh, $100,000, which is the second half of the loan to the CPA. We don't have cash on hand yet, but I'm meeting the loaner uh, tomorrow to figure out the details. And I expect it'll go to the CPA, you know, this week and then can then go to the town early next week as soon as it clears. How's the fundraising going? I think we have, so we borrowed 200,000 that we have to repay within three years. I think we have commitments thus far for about $80,000 mm. worth of repayment. Mm -hmm. um, so almost half of it. Um, and we're just sort of, a lot of that is larger donors um, and we've signed up eight or 10 monthly sustaining donors, smaller donors. And um, we have planned sort of around the completion of the project to do some mailings. We're going to do a mailing to everybody who's donated anything and a few other fundraising things sort of circulating around the completion of the project. So I think it's, I, I'm pretty happy with where we are fundraising. You're going to ask the select board to vote on the paint color? No, nobody else is allowed to discuss the color of the day. Yeah, wait a minute. This is the first time I'm hearing about paint color. So, our. Um, you got the high biz orange is off the table? Yeah. Okay. The Army Corps of Engineers project. Um, include the SHPO <laughs> review, which is State Historic Preservation, and they required that we stain the dam some color that matches the existing stone dam. And that language of some color that matches the existing stone dam is open for interpretation. Um, Sounding an awful lot like camo to me, which is good. So we, we did one test paint last week some people like it some people hate it um Fine. actually i'm gonna connect with barbara after this i think barbara's gonna pick up two more colors for me at home depot tomorrow 
um, and then it'll be warm enough Wednesday to do another test paint. So then we'll have three color options. Um, and then the following week, the representative from historic preservation will come out and be the ultimate decider of the color. Does the painting have to be done before the project is considered complete? No, we're going to apply for a permit modification based on the temperature and the the stain required. Right, yeah. and the stain wants the concrete to cure 30 days before we seal and stain it um, and then be above, you know, 50 degrees when we do it. So it's just not going to happen. Um, so it'll require a, an additional permit next summer from probably wetlands to allow us to lower the pond level eight or 10 inches so that we can stay in the dam. Um, but nobody thinks that's going to be a big deal. Yeah, after what we've been through. I, as I said to the engineers the other day, oh man, I was hoping to be done with this this year. And they laughed and said, <laughs> you'll never be done with this. <laughs> um, anything else on budget? No, I mean, we're, we're right. getting there. We're, we'll get that 100. Home stretch. Right. We'll do the 100,000 now, and then there will be a sort of cleanup donation in a right, month or two balance. when we know from the CPA for whatever the balance is. Yeah. So for the purpose of this motion, uh, would we... We're accepting a donation from the Curtis Pond Association in the amount of $100,000 to be put in the Curtis Pond Dam Fund. And is that fine to stand alone or, or do we need to authorize yeah. Kari to do that specifically since it's going to be something that is going to happen at a later date. I think I matter. think last time we just we just accepted we just, it we just accepted it and it doesn't really matter when yeah. the actual gotcha. comes. it's required. Okay, so yeah. I'll move that. Any bad? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Getting closer. Thank, Thank you, you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, 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 back to the agenda. Um, so we have uh, reports uh, next. Um, and uh, right now we've got uh, Tegan and uh, uh, Kari. Tegan, do you have any any particular items to, um, to cover? No, uh, it's been all elections all the time. As Barbara can tell you, we're getting probably 50 to 100 ballots a day in addition to... Lot. Folks who need their ballots, folks who need to register in Calus, folks who don't know where they're registered, folks who have lots of questions. Uh, so it's been basically low-level maintenance tasks and elections, uh, but things are going well. We're excited. Uh, we got over 40% participation today, uh, which is just very exciting. 40% um, of voters, town voters? Yeah. Yes, 40% of our registered voters have already turned in their ballots. Wow. That's a lot. I feel like two weeks ago it was like eight, third, yeah, yeah, it was super low. So um, there was great. a there's someone at Vermont at UVM doing a keeping tabs on this because we have to put everything in the portal through the state. And as of last Thursday, it was there was some other town that had 38 percent participation, but we were tied with three other towns for second place with 37 percent participation last Thursday. So I was pretty proud of that. Yeah. Can Calus somehow like offer a consulting fees for like all of our FEMA work and there? Like, can we put ourselves <laughs> for hire? Like, being, being a model uh, or uh, hire out yeah. passages. That's right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, speaking of which, can I say one other damn thing? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Tegan. There's another damn thing that has uh, just come up. <laughs> speaking another of the damn world, thing. Mm -hmm. another damn thing. There's two sort of awards in the works. One is um, for Larry Hebert's company got selected by, um, oh, uh, it's the John by John Deere to as their like construction firm of the year, and so John Deere sent this big film crew, and they filmed a day in the life of Larry Hebert. Oh my god! Getting up in the morning to eating breakfast. Uh, 
Going wow. to one job site, and they filmed for a while at the Curtis Pond Dam. Cool. And this will go into a giant John Deere promotional and this is a video. National? A national thing. A national John Deere? So, like so the Curtis Pond Dam will be forever Ooh. preserved in this national oh. ad. And this is, um, the, the, and that's completely, uh, that attention is completely unrelated to the lobbying that Chris Miller's doing for his John Deere sculpture. <laughs> I have no idea if there's a connection. There's a lot of continuity here. <laughs> yeah. But there's also, do you remember the name of the award BNK is going for? There's some no. state uh, project, construction project of the year award that they do. That Curtis Pond Dam is going to be nominated. I mm. profile project. Yeah. Well, what's the based on what? What What are the criteria? I. It's so I, beautiful. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's all the only dam rehabilitation project. It is, it is good marketing. It is it's it is good marketing yeah. for them. It's the only substantial dam reconstruction project in the state. Last year, this year, or next oh, year. Oh, so we have no competition. No. Is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the award is, no, the award is from, press. yeah, it's all press. kinds of press. Oh, okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, well, thank you, Barbara and Tegan, for the uh, your work related to the elections. Barbara, do you have yeah. another you comment? Like yeah. Questions? Yeah. So uh, back to the five o'clock agenda item. <laughs> Uh, I would like some direction from the select board regarding development review board recruitment. There's still two alternate seats that need to be mm -hmm. filled. Do you want us to continue the DRV alternate seats recruitment or give that a break for a while? Uh, I think let's give it a break until after we get through elections and okay. uh, and then maybe post it again. Just give okay. it a little bit of an air gap. So the uh, <clears throat> ordinance advisory committee, we still only have Jan right now. Do you want that to also be on break for a while? Yeah, or I think so. And there's that again. No, let's um, take that uh, put that on a break for now. You know, there's a there's a, a candidate that was up for kind of discussion, but there's a kind of a logistic uh, question uh, around their ability to to They're perform. But like right they they I, I would charge the um, ordinance advisory committee to. Keep working through their list and just let us know when when they're okay. ready to um to repost it okay and then my last one is the social services appropriations committee we only got the one applicant do you want me to post that one a second time a, a third time i posted it twice we've gotten one do you want that one posted or no more i mean i think yeah that let's repost that one uh mm -hmm. some more because uh, and maybe emphasize that um it, this is going to be directly tied to our budgeting and we need Anybody else who's uh, motivated to participate okay. um, to get Thank involved? You. Thanks, Barbara. I did have uh, one other quick thing. This is not a decision to make tonight, but uh, the we are required to make our website more accessible. The state is upping its standards. And before we budget for having someone go in and increase the accessibility or before Sarah and I go in there and do what we can on our own, uh, a big question that has come up is, retention of minutes for committees online. We have everything in the vault going back forever and ever and ever, but we need to kind of make a decision about how many years worth of minutes and decisions we want to keep on the website for various things. Uh, and the website is technically the purview of the select board. So that is just a thing to consider, not a thing to decide tonight if you don't want to, because it's 9.15. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the state get, has no, what is the state requirement? It's more the, the accessibility factor. Um, they need to, it, everything needs to be a PDF and it needs to be able to be read by an e-reader. And we have lots and lots of Word documents and things that are not easily read by e-readers. And the more documents we want to convert, the more money or time it's going to cost us. Wonder. Mm, I've noticed that there are some new uh, AR features for converting documents uh, that it's, it's like built into uh, Adobe Acrobat um, that may be able to support some of that. Um, Tegan, would you, right, this kind of ties back to the, uh, the planning conversation a little bit. Um, uh, 
Could I ask you to, at some point, at maybe after the election, uh, to reach out to RB and see if they have an opinion on how to make, uh, you know, like where to put a repository for uh, for these document uh, for these documents, uh, whether they live on like uh, a partition of a virtual server um, versus uh, like our web website serp dedicated server. Yes, I can ask them that question, but probably not before next Tuesday. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. And I think I would play into minute, the minutes conversation because I think that that would make a lot of sense for putting them all in the same place. Mm -hmm. Makes uh, sense. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Kari. Um, so I have one item uh, for you to consider. It. Um, I've had several conversations that uh, lead me to believe that it'd be in the town's best interest to provide some kind of end of year bonus for employees. Mm -hmm. And um, if, you, if you're not aware, up until the last couple of years, the town, I guess, was in the practice of doing an end of year bonus, and there are people that miss it and still expect it to some extent. So, um, and I do think it's within our budget because we've been understaffed both at, both at the office level by not having an assistant treasurer, but also at the highway department. So what my proposal is um, a $500 bonus to the six employees who are above the um, threshold for um, being eligible for benefits, essentially full time threshold, and um, and then uh, and then Ed Rowell uh, has asked multiple times to purchase uh, an old tra uh, trailer that is that we built and put into service in 1981, but haven't used in uh, six or seven years. He'd like to buy that. He's offered. He's asked me a couple times. I know he's asked other people about you know before me. Uh, he, he's offering to pay a thousand. John Stafford says the tires are shot. And it's it's eight hundred would be more than fair. And so my proposal is to let's give it to Ed. So give the trailer to Ed as a, a bonus. As in, in lieu of a cash bonus. Win win. So so the guy we just hired. Does he get a bonus too? I don't know. No, because part of that definition is okay. you have to be past your probationary period. Uh, so Steve, Steve Levenberg, who we hired in June, presumably would be, okay. but not not um, Drew, who we just hired. Okay. So that's the proposal, and um, and I I think we should talk about something for next year as well. Um, just so it's in the budget. So put it in the budget. We didn't think we, Yeah, we didn't. Do that. Yeah. We weren't kind of conditioned for that. And then also it largely applied. Um, that, that we, there, are, there are other bonuses that were built into the kind of negotiation process. So we ended up kind of skipping yeah. skipping the season, uh, the end of year one that was traditionally done. Um, so it, it is, I think, well overdue and, and, and certainly warranted. So Second. Second. Third. Uh, <laughs> any any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. There we have it. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks to all of the employees and certainly yeah. for the road crew. Thank you for the road crew. So the next two items are uh, our planned executive sessions. Um, the first one um, is uh, going to be a personnel uh, matter uh, related to the uh, road uh, mowing. And um, uh, the plan is to go into executive session with uh, Kari and Bill uh, uh, to provide the uh, uh, select board the opportunity um, to um, treat this as they would uh, any other personnel matter. Um, and as a uh, performance evaluation relative to uh, the events raised uh, by uh, by CRED. Um, so um, other members here uh, will uh, will not be invited into that executive session. That's how we would how we would treat any other personnel matter that would be raised by Kari. Um, 
we will come out of executive session and, uh, and, and likely have a statement relative to what's being discussed. Um, and then after that, we'll go into another executive session um, uh, to uh, do a performance evaluation uh, that has been planned uh, for, uh, for CARI. And just for, uh, I just want to make a special note there. Um, uh, uh, Rose, sorry. Um, <laughs> that um, for Kari's uh, executive session, um, at, at some point partway through, uh, Kari will be dismissed from that. So we'll initially invite him in and then he'd be dismissed so that the uh, select board can carry on with a discussion relative to that conversation. Does that sound like uh, a fair approach? I just wanna make sure that the minutes would reflect that Kari was dismissed before the select board had uh, further discussion. Okay, so um, as you pointed out on the first executive session, um, the motion will be made and the time has to be noted. I put 925, whoever's gonna make that motion. So when you come out, I need the time that you resume regular session and then what you're gonna report. And then the time that you go in for the one, the performance review, um, I don't think you really have to say what time you released him, but then the regular session resumed at another time and then you report out that. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you send some one of the select board members send that, I think we should be good. Okay. Uh, so before we head into the first executive session, um, uh, Craig, uh, you're here and you've stuck with us for the yeah. for the duration. Um, so before before we head into the performance evaluation uh, for the roadside mowing, uh, do you have any particular comment that you'd like to I, offer? I do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I I reorganized and typed up the comments that I made two weeks ago. Yep. And I brought these so hopefully you all could look them over. Um, because it was two weeks ago, mm -hmm. right? And and I added a couple things. The first of which is Kari did some good organizing um, between me and Bill, and the three of us sat down today and talked about the incident. Um, Bill apologized for not contacting me prior to mowing. We talked about a, a range of things that Kari can fill you in on more of that maybe. Um, and and Bill, and, and I'm not trying to stir up more than this deserves, but Bill eventually apologized for um, how I felt about being approached by a running piece of machinery. And that's the biggest thing for me. Um, I told these guys, I continue to wake up some nights and have that vision. It's, it's that serious. Um, I, I was going to ask if you would consider letting me sit in on the discussion. I kind of think you probably don't want to do that. Um, I know it's in your power to do that, but I, I just at least wanted to ask. Um, there are some things that I added and, and there are some thoughts that I had after we met today. And one of those things was, um, Again, it could have been avoided with a phone call and discussion. Um, and I wish that, Kari, you had, and, and I know Bill was gone, we couldn't find a time, but it was a whole month before I heard an apology. And, and I wish even that day or the next day, you could have said, you know what, Bill, come on, let's go up there. You should apologize for this, what happened. I, I guess I, as I thought about this afternoon, I, I wish something would have happened sooner than it did. Um, and I was busy too. Uh, Jordan, I want to point out that your comment, which I took issue with two weeks ago about, you know, you come in here quoting statute and that basically you were saying rubs you the wrong way and perhaps escalates it. And I think that tends to minimize the seriousness of what happened. 
in, in quoting the statute it, by me it did nothing to change what happened. I only pointed out that that, that is how it could be viewed. So, um, and just well, so I uh, I, I don't know that this that will will change anything. Uh, my my intention in saying in saying that wasn't that it personally rubs me the wrong way, but that it it's an approach that, um, in my experience, doesn't provide room for uh, a more measured dialogue and for apologies to be made and and for working through the dialogue that we've been trying to work through. That was really the only point. You know, I think we're living in an environment where it's really hard to work through hard conversations and um, uh, and and that is just a, a personal piece of feedback. Um, I certainly acknowledge that it's a hard conversation. So um, I was not personally offended by it, I, and I do take it seriously. I felt <clears throat> that my life was threatened. And I That's how serious it was. I hear you. So I stand by what I just said. I hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I I did read through the town personnel policy, and I would I would draw your attention to section five, which has to do with employees treating members of the public and other employees, et cetera, with respect, et cetera. I, I pulled it up on my phone. I can read it to you if you want, but you can find it. Mm -hmm. I found it on the town website. Uh, I, I think that is an important consideration. Um, you know, there are a couple of things at the end of this that may seem, um, uh, I don't know, extreme, maybe is the word. Um, the conflict of interest issue, uh, I have not lost track of. It's a separate issue. The road standards, separate issue. I think further discussion would be good. Um, but I really do not think it's appropriate for Bill to be hired again by the town. And I would even go so far as to ask for your resignation. It, it, you apologize. I'm not trying to negate that. Um, it's, it's, this is how much it's affected me. So with all that, I, I appreciate your time listening. Uh, well, thank you um, for registering that. Um... Uh, it, it will certainly be taken under consideration. I, uh, I, I, you're right. I uh, would not see it as appropriate to uh, to bring you into the executive session because I don't think that that would be appropriate under any personnel review. Uh, um, I understand. So, but I do appreciate you preparing this and organizing your thoughts and then uh, and then presenting them um, yeah. so that we can um, uh, bring that into consideration as we talk with Gary and Bill about it. And again, as I said two weeks ago, I, I feel very heard by you all. And I said that today to Kari and Bill. Um, you know, yeah, I think it's unfortunate. I wish it had, none of it had ever happened. I, I don't need it. Nobody needs it. Yep. So, all right. Thank, thank you, Craig. Um, so with that, um, I would entertain a motion to go into an executive session under 1 VSA. Uh, there, 313A3, A3, um, which doesn't require a particular finding. It's just for the purpose of uh, performing a uh, performance evaluation of a uh, town official and or employee, in this case, uh, Bill Davis, related to his role as an employee, um, as a tempor <laughs> temporary employee, was it or was a part-time employee? Seasonal. Seasonal employee for roadside mowing. Um, and moved. second? Second. All in favor? Yeah. And, and moved. Jamie seconded. Eight. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any opposed? Great. And we are in executive session. We'll